be able to identify every individual because your identity is very critical. We need to be able to identify your devices because that is very critical. And that introduces us into what we call biometrics and identification. It's very critical. The government of Nigeria continues to struggle in identifying the citizens. Uh, we know that the NIN was introduced. We hear of different numbers in terms of number of enrollment, and that is a major issue or challenge. As a matter of fact, identification is a major issue or challenge in all of Africa. If we're going to run on DLT-based payment structures, we need to be able to identify ourselves and our devices. And this leads us to the fact that we want to operate in what we call platforms and ecosystems. Keep in mind, I give a good example of an ecosystem, the Apple operating system and Apple products. You see the operating system, you see the device, you see the app store. That's an ecosystem. And that is what has made Apple the most valuable company in the world. And so we need to begin to think in that direction of ecosystems and platforms in Africa and in Nigeria. These are the domains that you, I was referring to that you're familiar with, and the fifth one, of course, is the cyber domain. And so, I'm sure Dr. Werem will be a student of Edward Deming, and this statement stands true to other people do. They must bring data. It's all about the data. And we're beginning to bring that data in Nigeria now. We're beginning to bring that data in Africa. So how do we solve this pressing problem for a billion people? Keeping in mind all the preamble that I've shared. We need to be innovative. We've said that enough on this platform, in every forum that we've been in. Innovation is key. And we're talking of innovation independent of the government. We need to be entrepreneurs. In fact, another word for entrepreneurship is businessman. When I was growing up, when we asked everybody, what does your daddy do? They say he's a businessman. That's entrepreneurship. So it has been in our DNA in Nigeria and Africa for that long. Businessman is entrepreneurship. What does it do? Find an opportunity, solve a problem, and get paid in the process. But more importantly, we need what I call digital economy enabling infrastructure. Digital economy, an infrastructure that enables that. So you have your rank and file regular infrastructure, yes? But we're talking of digital economy enabling infrastructure. That needs to be in play for us to be able to have our own WeChat, our own Alibaba, our own Alipay. And we celebrate our titans, the Congas, the Jumias of Africa and Nigeria. They are making progress in that direction. But you can see the limiting challenges that they begin, they continue to engage themselves with. Data. Your electronic footprint. In utilizing the electronic footprint, citizens of Nigeria and Africa, we need to ensure that our privacy and our confidentiality remains intact. Privacy is the expectation that what you know about me in your official capacity remains in that domain. Confidentiality is that you don't snoop because you have the, you have the ability to check in on me. Now, if you look at the country that solved that problem for 1.4 billion people, we know that there's been infringement on privacy and confidentiality. For Africa and Nigeria going in that direction, we need to build this in now before it goes beyond what we cannot you know, capture it in what we design and develop. And all of that, what do you do with the data? You're looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we are advocating once again that Africa needs to embrace what we call explainable AI. And so you need to be at least be able to, you, all of you have been somewhere and they told you the computer said this. This is what the computer said. You know, these computers, we used to tell them what to do. Then they started telling each other what to do. 
and now they are telling us what to do. So explain decisions that impact your credit score, that impacts the service that you get. Africa embracing this. Where if in Nigeria or in Africa, we have standardized ways of communicating, and especially in the financial industry. We have big players in Africa or in Nigeria that are trying to be on that African global scale. We have UBA, you have Access Bank, you have Echo Bank, but you can see there's still frictions in the movement of funds along those entities. They need to be, they need to be supported, they need to be enabled, the environment needs to be more conducive for them to do their business and that can impact you know, the economies. So in closing, uh, the policies need to be in place with that, that we need to know. They set the stage for standards for countries, for regions, for states. And these standards, they enhance what we call system interoperability. Not too much grammar for you. But I hope you get the analogy that there needs to be standards which are supported and encouraged by policies. In closing, this slide is deliberately empty because you are not. That will impact Nigeria, that will impact Africa, that will set us on a new stage. Thank you. Of the organizer of this, of this program, Digital Wonderful One, and I want to say kudos to you. Yeah, my question goes thus as an agricultural and farmer. In Africa, Prof, you are welcome. Uh, I want to believe that you heard that, you know, because whatever we are going to be talking about here is going to uh, communicate. So the question, question is what should our agenda? on this policy be talking about. I'm sure some of us were here yesterday and uh, listening to the last speaker is already setting a drive and a direction for us. So Prof, let's start with you. You are from the academia and then you have quite a lot of interest in terms of how R&D and uh, how it can culminate into development. What kind of agenda would you want us to drive in innovation for this cluster, for this, you know, uh, projects of digital economy and of course a realistic one what exactly would you be talking about sir okay that's a mouthful but I'm, I'm gonna try and uh, simplify it um, again please pardon me um, as as a professor we always start with what are the fundamentals let's get the fundamentals right so that we know what we're talking about uh, we're talking about digital economy now I know that most of you here have your phones so can i suggest i would do in class uh, what do we mean by digital economy that's the first thing so that everyone understands for policy the infrastructure that's a big one the digitalization of the business processes and the e-commerce the e-transactions those are the three key areas i hope i've been able to provide a bit more information Fantastic. I think that's a good start, actually. And I want us to hold on to the fact that across the agencies of the digital to NCC is not what it means to NITSDA. Um, 
Cooperation and Development, so OECD. Talk the environmental level, it needs to pro protect the environment as well. Um, and ad administration, it needs to be very clear. You know, you don't want any ambiguity, and I think this is some of the stuff that Prof was talking about. You don't want ambiguity, you don't want um, duplication. But at the core of it, it needs not to stifle innovation, right? It needs to be able to promote growth. If you take, and policy of its because I think when you think about that you've got that growth, you're not distorting the market and you're also promoting innovation. So policy of itself is not a bad thing. We've got the, uh, um, the Nigeria, some of the policies that he talked about, such as um, some policies that have been really great. For example, I think the speaker talked about BVN, for example. That was a great thing, but we need to align it with other you know, um, systems like NIN. But beyond that, there have been policies that have really grown things. And in Nigeria, Nigeria is actually seen as um, a front runner as far as policy. We've got quite a lot of policy, believe it or not. We've got quite a lot of policy. We've got quite a lot of regulation. That's not to say that there isn't more to do in terms of ensuring there's less ambiguity. Um, but there's also the issue of policy implementation, which is one of the biggest issues. Now, where policy has maybe backfired, if you take the example of Lagos, um, where it's teaming, I think it's got a population of about 21 million people. Now, at the time, um, companies like um, GoCada and Safe Boda that were start, I don't know if we're familiar with those names, but they were starting a kind of logistics, uh, will I say, a delivery companies using this sort of uh, the, the, the motorcycle version of Uber, if you want to call it that way. And at that point, Lagos State Government, and I'm sure for good reason, put out a policy that um, banned the use of Okada. That immediately, completely, uh, pretty much closed down um, Gokada, their company. Safe Boda had to ship, had to, I think it, it, it lost about 70% of its employees. Now, when that policy was being thought of, there was good reason behind it, right? But at the same time, I think dialogue is really important. So without those, without understanding the frameworks, without un having dialogue, policy beyond, will not be able to protect that innovation that we're looking for. So I think one of the things I think that might be important is developing um, maybe it's policy innovation task forces, whether that's within NITDA or in the right agency. I, think it's, I believe it's NITDA that's got that sort of mandate to do that. If you have policy innovation task forces um, that can ensure that some sort of dialogue around policy that affects the digital economy, then I think that would be, you know, a starting point. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. That's very fantastic. I think uh, one of the things I want to state in that uh, issue about mm. Lagos is like when President Obasanjo went to Tunis, I'm sure doctor will remember, Tunis, that is WISIS 2015, 2015, and then he saw some Chinese children with uh, laptops or tablets that they use in classroom. And he returned back to Nigeria and made a statement that everybody must have the computer or Nigerian initiative canning. Mm -hmm. And then all of that happened without any plan of infrastructure like Prof mentioned. Yeah. So the likes of Omatech, the likes of Sinos, everybody plugged in. The government ministries were mandated that all their staff must have the computers. And then they will begin to deduct a certain amount from their salary. I witnessed when some of our people in the ministry will get their laptops or computers and they will sell it at the gates. Because as far as they are concerned, government is deducting their salaries. So when they give them those computers, they just sell it off immediately, irrespective of the reason, the motivation. So one of the challenges we've had in Nigeria, like you have said, is for somebody to create an initiative, something that they think would be digitally commercializable, e-commerce businesses, and then somebody in the government office feels, oh, these guys are making money. Let's quickly work on a policy that uh, probably stop this or bring some of us to do the same business. And so before you know it, they try to sabotage that effort 
and then make sure that the person who started closed down and they eventually come up with a process to make it happen. That's a big challenge, actually. You know, for me, in the last uh, maybe 10 or 15 years, I have done quite a lot of policies for government. We have seen some of the challenges you have mentioned, but there is always issue of integration of the policy. I always say to people, one of the things that people taught prof late Professor Dora Akuili did so well was to make NAFDAQ known to Nigeria. The policies that instituted the acts of that agency could have been there for all the years and nobody would know about NAFDAQ like we don't know of even NITSDA. If you talk to people about NITSDA, people will be asking you what is NITSDA. The NCC, oh, okay, telecommunications, GSM. But the question is, what are their acts? How much of their awareness is known to people like you, Mr. Uh, that's Mr. Baba Yemi now. In the, in the private sector, how much of this policy that Prof mentioned of the strategic plan is known to the industry players to the extent that they can synchronize it, they can synergize, they can see a way to integrate what they want to do as business plan with what the government institutions and agencies will require of them. So you see that people will just start their business in Lagos. Everybody just wants to make their money. But the question is, somebody in the government is looking and saying, oh, these guys are making money. Let's come up with this framework. We already know it is in the policy strategy. You are not aware. So they come up with it and they victimize and they close you down. What is your reaction from the private sector? Mr. Babayemi. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So, Please, can you put the mic close to okay. Is this better? Thank you very much. So we have, um, we have a peculiar um, problem as a country. And once we understand that fact, then we are ready to solve the issues that would um, bring that will, that will be brought up. Now, currently Nigeria has a lot of laws that are overlapping and doing the same thing. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to do this now. As regarding tech in Nigeria, there are about, let me say, 15 major laws as regarding tech, and I'm going to read them out um, this morning. So number one, you have the Constitution of Nigeria. That's the ground norm that governs the affairs of Nigerians entirely. Number two, you have the Companies and Allied Matters Act. That's KAMA, that regulates company operations in Nigeria. You also have the NITDA Act. That's the NITDA you're talking about, the Act. You also have the Copyright Act. You have the Patent and Designs Act. You have the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. You have the NCC Act. You have the Central Bank of Nigeria Act. You have the BOFIA Act. You have Securities and Exchange Commissions Act. So we have a lot of laws, and that is the beginning of the problem of Nigeria. We have a lot of laws that are overlapping and are doing the same thing. Now, for example, section, I think section 57 of BOFIA, or 59 of BOFIA, permits CBN to issue licenses to people that want to go into fintech. Now, before you get to that stage, you must first of all have registered your company with the Corporate Affairs Commission. After that, you need to you get your tax. You pay NSITF. You pay PENCOM. So you, and before that, you can get to CBN. The requirements to get a CBN license will take you a long while. Now, NITA is not, NITA is not only the, on, the only unpopular industry. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of NITCOMSAT. NITCOMSAT is a, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting place. I was there yesterday, we went to the court call. It's an interesting place that does, that does broadcasting. So, if you are a content developer or you are, you are, into, you are into TV, you can, you can take your content to NITCOMSAT. NITCOMSAT does something what they call um, D2H, DTH, that is delivered to home. So you can take your, con your content to NITCOMSAT and NITCOMSAT to push it out for you at a fee. But Nigerians are not aware. Why are they not aware? Because government is not doing as much as it should in making these things popular. Now, if you're not into the tech space, you won't know what NIT that does. If you're not into, into the communication space, you might not really understand the functions and the powers of NCC. So I don't blame when, when private people in the private sector don't know generally what happens in every sector. They might know what applies to their sector and stick to it. So we have a lot of laws that are overlapping, which we need to check. So aside having regulations, are we ready for those regulations? 
Nigeria is good in bringing out regulations, drafting policy, white paper documents, but are we ready for that? Now, when you started, you said we have to fix our problem. We have to fix our Nigeria's problem the Nigerian way. We cannot apply a South African solution to a Nigerian problem. Nigerian problems must be solved in a Nigerian way. And what do I mean by the Nigerian way? We must understand the people, understand the dynamics, understand the needs and the requirements of persons in Nigeria. Now, and you talked about how government policies always try to frustrate the um, development. And it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. And government has to wake up to the reality that we cannot keep on stopping growth in the name of regulations or in the name of policies. We must ensure that policies and regulations, if possible, foresee the future. If possible, foresee the future and seek to solve problems. So now, as lawyers, when we are trying to draft documents for clients, one of the things that we look at is if party A does this to party B in the future, how is my client protected? So a lawyer is always thinking that, how can I protect my client? If government, and this is, this is where I'm going to stop, if government can think, if this happens in the future, how can I protect this tech industry in Nigeria? That would be our solution to our problems. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. I think uh, one of the things I want you to look into is we are here. I don't know how many government agencies are here this morning. And unfortunately, many times they may not be available. So the question is, how do we bring all of the issues that are concerns to their table? You know, the interesting part is that most of the policy processes, they invite us as stakeholders. If somebody, for instance, is representing NCS, another person is representing CPN, in fact, I've been on one or two of these policy times, and I saw many of our colleagues who were there. And over one of the conferences of uh, AGM, and one of the critical issues on the electoral process, and I mentioned the Ministry of Social Social did this policy with your members there, and nobody in the hall is aware. You see, that's the problem. The creation of awareness, you are in the media plus place, the awareness creation, the, the, the need for, recently I was part of a, uh, a forum on the aging policy for senior citizens. And one of the things I saw that that agency did, of course, the, new, the DG of that agency is a very new person. She has been in the NGO sector for a long time. So she understood it. Because those are the issues where you put the wrong people in some of these positions. They don't know what to do. The lady called almost all the media organizations, both print, TV, and they were there. And you officially launched them into that program so that if they cough, the Nigerian people must know and see it everywhere, anywhere. And that is the beginning of it. So in terms of advocacy, in terms of integration, in terms of creating awareness, because when people talk, like Mr. Baba Yomi just said, and said, needs that law and government, the government is that needs that. Everybody in that office represents the federal government of Nigeria. So when we make it look like uh, the office will be sitting in there and then somebody will from anywhere come and tell their story. So from your own perspective within the media space, how do you want us to get these agencies to actually work with the media to make Nigerians understand what government is saying so that Nigerians also can give a feedback to them of what they want government to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Wumi. Like you have mentioned, the, the, the role of awareness in having this whole conversation is very, very important and key because in the end, if you get to do these things within the confines of a hall or within the confines of a conference room and the information does not go out, then the aim is really defeated. Now, in the media, for the media, some, for the past three years, we have seen in Nigeria, whether we like to, just to say it as it is, because you get to even go to a scene and you get to go back to the office because on friends, it can easily be disseminated. So that way, information is not wasted because the, the keynote speaker talked about data. Information is data. 
So if we have all of this out there, then more people get to understand. Because what is digital economy? Your phone, having transactions done digitally on your phone, is what it basically encompasses. So the media, they're really putting in the work, but there needs to be a collaboration. It's a symbiotic relationship. You, the, the bo both parties have to come together for it to work. And that, that's what I think it is, basically. Very well. So I think uh, the last round we are going to be looking at, what is our submission? As Digital Africa is 10, and we are looking at driving innovation across Africa, what would you like to see in the policy framework? What kind of agenda do you think... Um, as an advocate, Digital Africa can begin to channel with all of our support. It's very interesting, the crop of uh, industry players that participated in this anniversary. And that states to that fact that we are very interested. We want things to work. And like, like Prof said initially, it's a set of rules that policy means. So if we want to set the rules, I, I, I will quickly say this before you go ahead and speak in two, two minutes. There was a policy meeting I was invited to. And so I realized that why they were there, I thought it was a stakeholders to put in contact, but I realized that the sitting permanent secretary had so much relationship with the National Assembly member. So she's trying to push what we call a law to be uh, promulgated for them so that they can do whatever they needed to do. So while we were discussing, and then, then it was about agriculture, because I heard him speak about agriculture so well, so I asked a simple question. Where is the policy that stated the strategies of what the law we are sitting at here? Because they were talking about cassava, you know, and the different uh, composition of local products within the floor, for instance. And the farmers were all there. They were all speaking on complete level. The ministry was insisting on what they want to push. And the question I had to raise is that, why will you be pushing an agenda for people who are in the industry, who are saying completely contrary experience of what you have in the document? And they told me this thing has gone on second reading, <laughs> unfortunately. So when I asked, where is the policy strategy for us to be a landmark and there is no policy at all? That's to tell you how things... So when you hear of the strategic plan and you see the big uh, agencies pushing for it, you need to first ask them. Where is the policy? What is it that startups, young people, Otiba people, Adway, all of these people, where is it their contribution on what exactly this framework called the policy should have? Prof, let's take it from you. I will take it two, two minutes and we'll take questions after that. Dangerous. How do you give a professor two minutes? Okay, <laughs> let, let me try. Um, Again, there's, there are so many angles to look at this, but let me try and narrow things. First, digital economy is about exploiting the capabilities of our digital technologies to do what we have to do. Let me just keep it very simple. Digital economy is really about exploiting, making use of the digital technologies to do what we have to do. Now, if you're in government, you need to do that. If you're in the private sector, you need to do that. If you're an ordinary citizen, you need to do it. Now, whether you want to do it or not is out of the question because it will make you do it. So, if you say you're not going to, you, you're going to visit your family instead of making a phone call, well, you better make sure you have enough money to travel from point A to point B to get your security and so on. So the phone is there. So the technology is there. Make use of it. So that's one way. I'm talking to the ordinary people. So let's, let's go back to what the grand issues. We have passport number. I'm coming back to your <laughs> keynote. We have your driver's license. I'm talking about adults now. We have now, what is it? Permanent voter's card. We have NIN, we have BVN. All of that is one data point that identifies you and I. But it's not sitting on one database. It's not sitting anywhere you can harmonize them. So you can imagine the challenge of the lawyers. When you bring a case, they have to go through all kinds of regulations. Um, and of course, you live in a country where we do not want to obey the rule of law. So 
here are my pointers, please. First, we've got to understand that you have to obey the rule of law. If you don't, it doesn't matter what, because policy at the end of the day, your policy that is actually concrete is law. So remember, you start first of all with having norms that everybody agrees to. Then you take those norms, you, you know, put them into a code. Then finally that code becomes law. Now the problem there is that society moves ahead. So that law sometimes can be lagging, as I mentioned earlier. So those are some of the challenges. Then the last bit, please, we can do it. Because we did it under COVID. You, I, was getting, I was getting messages in South Africa from NCDC about stay at home, do whatever. So they were able to use the same digital technologies to communicate to all of us about COVID. We shut down. We, the whole world was able to shut down economies overnight via what? Digital technologies. So we can. Yeah? So it's not about sitting down, writing policies or whatever. Get on with the action. We can do it. And I agree with my media sister. Please, there was no and Nita and whoever else should not be here. I was at a conference in Brazil and I didn't realize that the whole group that was sitting there was actually the minister. The minister was in the back. So they deliberately hit the minister because they didn't want the media circles. But the minister then sent a number of his staff sitting in front there listening to every word each one of us was saying, making notes. As we departed, the minister asked for some of us to be dragged to, his, to where he was hiding. He said, look at, look at our policy. Please, I'm going to keep you here for a long time. Look at our, we'll give you food, don't worry. Don't go to the dinner. You know, please look at our policy. Tell us where we can improve things. That's, I'm talking about Brazil. I'm not a Brazilian, but they saw me well enough to drag me into the hall and ask, let's start getting these things done. We can get them done. Absolutely. I was invited to a meeting recently, and uh, the crop of all the government officials came. They did the opening ceremony. And the next second, everybody was walking out of the hall. I had to stand up and I stood by the door and I told them, if you go out of this hall, you will be doing Nigeria. It's a well thought out project on behalf of my minister and is listening. But we need to get to the point where we need to begin to get them to stay. Where they, we need to be getting them to listen and to take action. Thank you so much. Mr. Abayemi, I will go to you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Prof, for your... So, um, I'm talking about the way forward. What is the way forward? Because um, we, we all agree that there are problems. We all agree that situations are not at the best level yet. So, um, one would be, and I'll be advocating this for the federal government, um, we need to create what I call a digital village. Now, AFCTA has come to be, Nigeria has signed it. Um, I was discussing with my friend and they are still in negotiation phase with the AFC, AFCTA. Now, but Nigeria as a country needs to have a place called a digital village. Now, what's a digital village? And their job solely at that digital village is providing constant solutions to everyday problems. Now, once we have a digital village... A lot of um, relevance in the last couple of years. They're quite formidable. So I think we should engage with those kind of organizations. Within the NESG, there's an organization called the Policy Innovation Group. And what they do, I think they're quite relevant. It's quite new in the continent, I would argue. I think the only other place where they have it is in South Africa. And what they do is they look at policies and they see which ones are working, which ones are not. You know, and what's been the impact? You say you've developed a policy, but has it really advanced the cause? So I do, I, I do want to come back to that uh, policy innovation task force. The other thing I wanted to talk about was what they call um, regulatory sandboxes. And what's a sandbox? It's um, an environment with, within which you are allowed to test an innovation without the sort of, uh, and that is governed by the relevant agency. So it could be NICTA itself, um, sort of supporting this regulatory sandbox. So you've got a new innovation. And I would argue there are two sides to the coin. I know there's the argument that, oh, somebody sitting in government, you know, says, oh, there's money to be made here. So I'm going to put a policy so that I can get a share of the cake. 
But what I have seen um, in, my, in my years, I've seen that too, don't get me wrong. But there are really intelligent people in government that make, you know, that create some policies that work, right? One example you talked about was Kama. Now, few unicorns, as they call them, that are bringing in, bringing in new ideas, new innovations. Allow them to test it in an environment. I believe there's a precedence to doing that because CBN did something like that um, to allow for uh, online, creating the infrastructure for online financial payments. So we can replicate things like that. I think those are two tangible things. And I do think, and maybe here I'm not too, I'm speaking as a layman now, is redefining what we mean by small companies or startups. I believe, and my colleague here will know better, when we put policies, when government puts policies in place and levies, when you define a small company as a company that's making, is it 25 million? That's not a small company. I, you know, I don't know what, that is not a small company. And then you levy, and I think this is in the NITDA law, you levy 30 million on an individual that defaults. Those kind of levies, we need to, so it goes back to the framework, right? We're thinking about the three parts of that framework, the social, the environmental, the administrative. When I was talking about the OCD, even though you want to caution business, you don't want to make it extinct. So even if a business or whether it's a technology business was to um, break the law, I'm not saying we should you know, accommodate, you know, accommodate law breaking. Even if it wants to do that, you need to put a proportionate levy on that company. Otherwise, you run the risk of um, shutting it down. And what does that company do? It provides employment, it provides jobs. And we know how much unemployment is a problem. So for me, it would be those three things. So really looking at that um, digital, sorry, the policy innovation task force, it would be looking at creating those regulatory sandboxes. And thirdly, you know, looking at policies that have proportional levies or maybe redefining um, some of the standards that, or terminologies we use to define small companies. Thank you. Oh, please. Thank you so, so much. I guess this conversation is much more interesting. Yeah. And then, really, uh, media. <laughs> really, you see, quite a lot of the policies, like you identified for us, they are working. But you see, this issue of digital economy, like Prof said from the beginning, you will be surprised at what everybody calls fintech. CBN understood it in a completely different way than all of us in the industry. And so recently I was challenging a media practitioner. I said, you guys in the media sector of IT, you seem to be more popular than those who are doing the real technology because they seem to promote every government agencies and the rest and the rest. And so the question is, what exactly it should be the proper way for us to promote issues around digital economy, around the knowledge economy, around research and development in this space, around hardware, around software. Yesterday we were saying something, I think, people don't even talk about hardware in this part of the world. And that is where bulk of the money is coming from or is going through. Imagine how much, I mean, exports or so that China is doing to all of those parts that we buy every day. So these are critical issues. How do you report it? How do you talk about the conversation that uh, the keynote speaker just gave to us today? How will a media person relay that to the natural layman Nigerian who needs to use phone and use other technologies? And Prof was talking about payments on the card. We know we do that. I'm surprised your Uber driver didn't allow you to pay with your card, but that is actually happening. So how do you make sure that people do all of these things that CBA called cashless. When cashless started, even in Lagos that they test run it, it worked. Most of the business people started using their POS, they started doing all of that. So it must see we put ropes on our necks and put all those caution fees before we become digitized? That's the big question. Indeed, a very, very big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think significantly the media over the years, especially we, as we evolved around the whole digital space, COVID-19 brought about a stay-at-home economy that we have seen continuously thriving. So we've seen the media doing so much in terms of financial literacy. 
personally, I, I am a TV presenter, so I know over the years how many people from the private sector, even from the public sector that I, I have been able to speak with, interview on different occasions on the startup economy, the startup ecosystem, the tech ecosystem. So the part where the media needs to step up the game with what they are already doing definitely is in terms of doing financial literacy because there's a direct, as the world is growing, there's a direct impact or connect between the internet and the household welfare as it is now. So the person, you have a phone, you can use the internet of your phone to do different things. You even get to see a lot of advertisements on social media, oh come and buy data from me for so 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 amount, which is way cheaper. So if we are able to also, it goes back to the issue of infrastructure that Prof talked about. So the media needs to put the word out there, like you have stated, educate the populace on what needs to be done. Because we have a poor population in Nigeria. So if we are building a digital economy, we cannot say we want to exclude these people. The person, the trader that sells Akara by the roadside, the trader that sells pineapple and watermelon with a tray on the head, how can we ensure that we bring this, this, this group into the brackets? Because if we are building a vibrant digital economy, they should not be left out. And that's where the media comes in. Because even the person that is going around with their crops, they have a small radio they are listening to. And they are listening to what you are saying. So how about we put the word out there more? I'm tasking myself also, of course. <laughs> put the word out there more to encourage more Nigerians to embrace this structure. In the next two, by 2030, the Nigeria we have today will not be the Nigeria we have in 2030. God's willing, we want to evolve, we want to grow digitally. So a lot needs to be done in financial literacy. Also to add, it is said most times that, oh, Nigeria, we don't have a debt to GDP problem, we have a debt to revenue issue. In my business broadcast, I do like a chart where we look at commodities around the world, Brent crude, palm oil, cocoa and you see Brent crude trading for maybe a hundred plus dollars and you come down the chart and you see palm oil trading for one thousand dollars thereabouts and you think to yourself how many hundred dollars am I going to find in one thousand dollars so how about we begin to tilt towards some of these sectors that are the future the ICT sector contributed over 16% to the GDP in the first quarter of the year 2022. And we have seen that growth since the advent of COVID-19. So we need to look from the prism or from the lens of those that are in the community, not creating policies outside. You cannot sit in the confines of your office and create a policy for the tech bro that wears a t-shirt and a short. It doesn't work that way. So we need to create policies that are geared towards the development of these people. We have a lot of young people living in Nigeria. It has become a problem. We cannot have our talents going to develop other countries. And it needs to stop. But how can it stop? The environment, just like Oiza said, the environment needs to encourage growth. It should not stifle businesses. To unlock or harness these potentials, we need an environment that works. I really hope the communique gets to the government people so they see that People are speaking. We can never get tired of talking, of course. Our voice seems to be the only power we have at the moment. So the media, we need to step up financial literacy. But to achieve the bogus figures we get to see on TV, a colleague told me one time, Christy, you like calling billions. Where is your billion? So to achieve these big amounts of monies and bringing revenues into the country, the digital economy needs to kick up and start working efficiently. Thank you so much. I really celebrate all of you. I really wish I could, the Brazilian president did with you. We could just camp ourselves inside one room. And it will really influence the, everything that happened in Africa. My question is this. I, can, I want to just summarize all what you have said around cultural revolution. If we don't have revolution of our culture. All what we're discussing like this will not be happening. So what are we going to do now in order to cause that cultural revolution? nature of digital economy itself, we can't have a, it is, it's something we continue to engage. We can't just wake up and say, we have a policy. 
and as such, I look through the frameworks we've had, the models, and what the view, and one actually stood out, and that's the um, digital evolution in that world. And this, this document is supposed to be driven solely by what we refer to as the digital transformation like in all agencies. And when you, as, uh, as the moderator has mentioned, talk to someone at this agency, they don't know what is happening there. I witnessed that, like, even to get <laughs> enough, what's the big of a hassle? I had to make do with what I had and put together to have this policy. And once again, I would like to thank everyone here. And I think it would be good, it would have been better to have people from um, the ministry. We are here, that, actually. So you that don't that know to... them, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah. That's it's an agency. And how they, the Germans helped them to redesign the wheelbarrow and blah, 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 blah. And the Brazilian guy in the audience got up extremely mad and said, what you're talking about is something that we want to eliminate because when that guy pushes his wheelbarrow across the street, he blocks traffic and it causes more problem environmentally because when you block traffic, they have more cars sitting and putting out the fumes. So coming back to how do we make this work? Nigerians, naturally, any economy where you have a lot of constraints, people tend to be frugal innovators. What do I mean by frugal innovators? People who do things to satisfy their immediate need. So in that environment, Nigeria is very, very rife with people doing what they have to do to satisfy their immediate need. Because we are very constrained in many ways we've talked about. So in that context then, Nigerians need to utilize digital technologies to do what they have to do to resolve their immediate need. Long and short, closed. The laws, the policies are like this. My grandfather used to say, policy is like holding potty in your hand. The more you hold it tighter, the, the more the potty leaks out. What am I saying? Let's not worry too much about getting the right policy because you're never going to get it because you have a very, very fast moving target. So let's make sure that Nigerians understand, please media, you need to help us in every way, that they need to do what they have to do to satisfy their needs, but in a law abiding manner. Now, they won't understand all the laws, but let them at least know that there is a reason for a policeman standing there, there is a reason for government departments, and if every Nigerian understands this issue about being law-abiding, I think a lot of the policy issues will actually meld immediately. So we need to get a message. Just as my last point will be, if we were able to halt this economy, if the US was able to halt the economy, if the whole globe was able to halt because of COVID, we don't, I mean, what, how big a policy do you need? How big a policy do you need? It was straightforward, we can. So utilize digital technologies to do what you have to do to satisfy your need in a law abiding manner. That's my punchline. Thank you so, so much. I think that's a very fantastic one. Yes, sir, let's have you. Um, thank you very much. So I think the first thing I would say is get your PVCs. <laughs> it's very important that... I don't know nobody has spoken about it this morning, but it's important that you get your PVC. Everybody should get their PVC. It's a message that everybody's speaking about now. And no matter the... So the people that are going to draft these policies are people that we're going to elect. 2023 is almost here. Who you elect will determine the policy. So you might go into an industry where the person you don't elect or refuse to elect will make regulations that will affect you. So, so the, my first point is get your PVC. My second point is be interested in laws that will affect you. So as a law firm, lay attorneys, one of the things that we started doing was we do, we do a post weekly what, that we titled What Says the Courts. So it's a weekly post on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook that tells you what the court says on various topical issues. So it could be from divorce to tech to fintech. 
and we post the stories every week. So as a private organization, we are doing our part in ensuring that people are enlightened. But no matter how we push out our content, Nigerians must be interested in learning about those content. So back to my first point, get your PVC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This PVC issue, you know, a part of the education is that it isn't just a PVC to say this is the president we want. You must elect the right person to the National Assembly. Hello? Both at state and at federal level. Because irrespective of who your president is, if the assembly member decide to impeach him, you don't have a say. It is like the delegates, isn't it? Yes, we don't have a say, unfortunately. So it isn't just about who our president is. It's about who are those representing us at those constituency level, at the House of Reps, at the state houses of reps. Very important. Thank you. So, uh, Christiana, let's have you. I guess Oiza will be the last. <laughs> yeah. Will be the last. I want you to not be the last. Uh, okay. So I think for me, it, it has to be education. So everything we are saying, if we are not able to convey the message to people, you know, a lot of people see digital and tech as a whole lot of jargon. Because when you talk about coding, you talk about programming, you talk about inter the whole interface looks very difficult. So a lot needs to go into the education part of the whole conversation. Because even if there's a policy document, personally, I don't think there's any policy you are looking for that you will not find in this country. So we, we are not devoid of policies. I think the keynote speaker spoke about implementation. So in that implementation process, how about we even break it down to the barest minimum so everybody can be carried along. So we don't have whereby elites are moving forward, then the other parts, they are being left behind. So we need, we need education part needs to be harped upon as we move forward into ensuring that we create a robust digital economy in the country and we all have to be interested. It's not about just or is being interested or the learned man here or prof, prof is in the academia so he will be interested. We all have to be interested in the conversation for value to be added upon us and also value to be added in the general economy and for yourself. So interest plays a key role. If you are interested then you can get educated. Thank you so much. And I want to add to that that it isn't just education, it must be in the local languages. Very localized. I remember many, many years there is this meeting in Ghana and I was invited as an NGO and we got there, we didn't know what, they said localization of uh, the internet. And we got there, we were the first set of people that worked with them. They chose me from Yoruba, two other guys, Igbo and Ausa. And we were the ones that trans started the translation of Google to Yoruba, to Ausa, and to Igbo. So, and it was very interesting. They brought other people from South Africa, Zulu language, different languages that are very local to different countries across Africa. And we began to translate what it is that it can be said in Yoruba, in English, or in Ausa, and in Igbo. And I think it is time, like you said, for us to begin to do, even banks, when you want to go to ATM now, they will ask you which language you want to speak so that you don't make mistake of transferring your money to somebody else. At least whatever your language, you can speak it. Thank you so much for that. And of course, Oiza, let's hear you. So unfortunately, my two panel members have stolen my points. <laughs> so I was going to build on, you know, but then maybe I'll build on it. But coming back to the point the gentleman um, in the brown made about cultural norms and I was thinking about that um, and I thought yeah there's a part that cultural norms have to play you know um, if you think about it as Nigerians I'm a Nigerian myself how many of us really engage with policy you don't engage with the policy until there's a reason that it affects you or if I'm starting a business a food business then I'll suddenly know that NAFTA exists and I start engaging with the policies of NAFTA where I'm beginning to see bottlenecks. It needs to be an in, somebody once said that, I don't know, the average Nigerian doesn't like to read a book. I don't know whether that's, that's right or not, but it's that, it's that culture of engaging. I think as Nigerians, I've always said that we're very resilient people, but the, our resilience is as much as a blessing as it is a curse. And I'll give, that exa I'll give some examples to that. So if, for example, our 
schools are closed, there are strikes, and you're realizing the education system doesn't work. What do you do? You save enough money to send your children abroad. The woman that is selling a car on the road, I've seen women selling a car on the road that will sell that car and send their children to school abroad. If you don't have water, what do you do? You dig a borehole. If you don't have power, what do you do? You buy a generator, you put an inverter. We're resilient, we find solutions, but we don't go back to look, what is our right? What does the policy actually say? So our resilience is a blessing, but it also can be a curse if you want to look at it that way. So I think there is a whole beyond that messaging that we're talking about, and I think the media has a whole a huge role to play, but I don't think it's the media alone. It's been very targeted at about, you know, you talked about education. Yes, there's education in school. That's great. But within the offices, within the agencies, how are we engaging, you know, the staff of that agency to understand the role that they play? How are we changing those mindsets? How are we thinking generationally? So beyond just, you know, what's in it for me? You know, you look at Dubai as a, as a nation. Somebody sat down in Dubai and said, 50 years from now, I want this country to be the tourist destination of the world. And it was, it, it was a generational thing. It didn't, it didn't just immediately happen. So I'm going back to the point this gentleman made about cultural norms. And I'm someone that always believes that, and it's not a cliche, I really do believe that if you're going to change, it needs to start with you. If there are policies in place that don't work, how, let, if, we probably don't want to put up our hands, but if, for example, I don't know, you want to go get a passport or you want to go get your driver's license, you're gonna, and even though all those systems have been digitized, but somehow you, you face the bottleneck. There is the urge to bring out a dash. There is, it's the culture. Let's pay it. Let's just pay and get it through because you can't be bothered with the hassle. You know, so there is a culture change that's needed. And I think in a lot of programs that we do, social norms are so big. It's big in everything. Up to the point now we're thinking about what do social norms have to do with policy, right? And what's the political economy as well? When we say political economy, who are the power brokers in that, in that space? And social, you'd be surprised that in some communities, it is traditional, traditional uh, and religious leaders have a stronger say than somebody in government, a community will listen to their religious and traditional leaders. So I think we need a holistic approach in terms of the messaging and be very targeted, putting out a campaign that says, oh, go and you know, register for your PVC is one thing, but what is the benefit to me? We need to communicate that. So I'm agreeing with you, <laughs> not contradicting you, but what, what is the benefit to me? So in our communications, if we are saying, what's the benefit of you engaging with this law? How does it affect my household? Then I think we'll start to see people engage because if I can't translate what it means to me, I'll disengage from it. Thank you. Fine. I wish we have all of the day to continue. I want to say thank you to all of my panelists. Professor Joe Amadi, thank you so much for those wonderful contribution. Christiana Amodu, I celebrate you. God bless you. Baba Yemi Olani, your Esquire. Thank you so much. I'm sure we will get you involved in some of the legal frameworks. And of course, Oizan Nikosin, thank you so, so much for those sections. And of course, I want to thank myself for doing this. And um, please, um, can you please permit me to do one small action plan from this section? And that action plan is to ask our audience, all of what we have said, which of them will you want to personally because we can leave this meeting and nobody is ready to take a, a stand for anything. Which of them are you interested in doing a personal touch and saying, from today, I want to take on to know about so, so, so policy. I want to know who are the beneficiaries of this policy or the actors. I want to just put a social media platform on to begin to sensitize myself and some other people that are in my network on this policy. Anybody in the house this morning, you are interested in doing anything around that? Please, it's very important. Thank you, thank you. Because that's the way to start. If you don't do that, students, the first conference I went for in 2005 in Ghana, that's why you see things on Ghanaians, on Ru uh, Rwanda, and we will say, oh, they are doing better. They have their students from uh, year two in the university seated in the conference with us. 
200 level to graduating years and they give them task. They made them to start NGOs and foundations to begin to engage their learnings. And this is very important. So don't just sit there and say, I'm a student, I'm just starting. You can start now. And the policy drive affects every one of us, like she said. Thank you for having us. Please, if you are interested, meet with them and register and tell them these are the areas I want to engage. And I'm sure we can do better after now. Thank you for having us. God bless you all. Please, can we appreciate our panelists and the moderator? And can we have a quick photo of... of Yes, please. Group pictures. <laughs> Thank you very much. Quickly, please, group pictures for the panel. For gender balance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please just appreciate them again. I'm sure if we didn't get anything, we probably got get your PVC. And whatever you're doing, do it in a law-abiding manner. Get involved and educate yourself and people around you. So the next panel is on, the next um, session is a fireside chat. And it's on building data reservoirs and analytics in Africa. And I'm going to be inviting the moderator Mr. Bosso Ayeni, he is the Managing Director and CEO of Compumetric Solutions. Please let's appreciate him as he comes up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here afternoon today to continue the Digital Africa session. My name is Bosu Ayeni, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Krish Rag Ranganath to this fireside chat. Dr. Krish is the Chief Technology Officer of Africa Data Center. Please do make yourself comfortable. Really nice to have you here. Yeah, so the first thing I would like to say in looking at your profile and over two decade experience, most of, uh, most of which have been focused almost entirely on technology and um, more than half of it you have spent in Africa, it appears. So uh, this is still home for you. You're, you're not far from your native Asia. And indeed, Africa, from what you have done, you've been here and have contributed immensely. Please tell us a bit about your journey in Africa and the kind of work you've done in Nigeria. Uh, thank you, Dawson. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, this African journey started around 15 years back, though it was not planned. You know, when I packed my bags into my... When I packed my bags into Africa, a lot many people asked my question, why Africa and why Nigeria? And I said, just let's try. That's how I came here. But um, as you rightly said, uh, you know, this is second home, correct? So, especially in Nigeria, uh, put so much of an effort onto various aspects of the business, development of the uh, societies. So, still try to 
Do Dr. Chris, sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure the audience is hearing you clearly. So what we will do, if you don't mind, we will swap seat. This works really well, and then I will figure out what works with the other two microphones. Thank you. So, you know, so eventually it became a, a second home, especially in Nigeria. I know I spend uh, some good time and uh, still spending a lot of time here, especially on the technology side, where I can contribute a um, lot and especially even bringing up the, uh, uh, what we call the capacity development. And because um, it's a small dream, it was Silicon Valley for Africa. That was a small dream which I had when I came into Nigeria. But because the, the, the reason is very simple because of the reception I received from the people. You know, it was uh, completely opposite of the predictions what people told me about Nigeria. So I'm still pushing forward to that on how we can get it. I cannot alone do this. This can be done with the people, with the system. And I think um, I'm moving forward in a positive way. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, in a, okay, this is pretty long. So in, in a nutshell, of course, um, you, you just affirmed that Nigerians are hospitable people. Your background or your native is India. And um, India and Nigeria are common in a number of ways. Today, we will be looking at data reservoir and analytics. Today, you are the CTO of Africa Data Centers. Now, from just first a global technology landscape perspective, what are the similarities you see between Nigeria and your native India from a technology landscape perspective? Both nations are thickly populated. That is one of the biggest advantage we have. If you talk about India, around 1.35 billion people. If you are talking about Africa, it is, I mean, Nigeria, it is around 200 million plus, correct? And uh, Nigeria being the highly populated country in Africa, which makes uh, a lot of positive attributes. And uh, comparison wise, okay, technology, both the nations are growing economies. If you take Nigeria today, uh, which is like around 25 years back of India. I can say that India was still growing and it is still growing. We can actually catch up with uh, the pace if we move a bit faster. But in certain areas, um, Nigeria is really fast growing, especially on the, uh, a bit on the telecom side as well as on the banking side. Some of the technologies what we use as on today is not used in many part of the world or even the grown up economies. So there is a faster growth, it can be made a bit more faster. So, and I think um, we are heading towards that, you know, a bit more aggressive way in adopting technology. So both nations are adopting the technology in much faster way. Thank you, thank you for that. You, you know, um, you just alluded to something that I find really, really interesting. But before I continue, I'd like to confirm if the audience hear Dr. Krish clearly. Okay, I'll do one more experiment. Let's swap the microphones and see if... So could you try and go ahead and say something with this microphone? I want to be sure this really, really projects your voice clearly. Hi, um, Dr. Krish. Okay. Oh, all right. So fair enough. So what I will do is a quick recap of the second question. So the first time he introduced himself, uh, Dr. Krish has had a long journey about his journey with Africa started about five decades ago. He's met a lot of Nigerians, and from a business perspective, about 30 years ago, 
he's been having interaction with Africa and specifically uh, more with Nigeria. And the summary is that Nigerians are very hospitable people. I went ahead to ask a question about similarities between the Nigerian and Indian economy from a technology landscape because he's, he's native, he's, a, he's an Indian native by, by, by birth. Uh, I'm sure you should be a naturalized Nigerian by now. You've been around for so long. Not yet. <laughs> okay, so he did confirm that there are a lot of relationships that Nigeria, in his view, is on the same trajectory with India, developing economies. Perhaps Nigeria is a few decades behind in some ways uh, compared to India, but he also did say that there are some technologies, specifically in banking and telecoms, yep. where he would consider Nigeria ahead of a lot of the rest of the world, including perhaps India. Now, I'd like to take you on on that. Um, one would wonder that if there are technologies that are so being deployed in Nigeria, if those things were happening in most other economies, the people behind those technologies would have taken them global and perhaps would be multi-billion entities today. Why do you think Nigerians are not doing that enough? I say enough because we are beginning to see people do that. But why are we not doing that enough? Because for at least a decade, I have heard people say, especially what we now call fintech, we would just call it banking then or internet banking or whatever, that because of the challenges of Nigeria, the last panel talked about innovation and people using digital economy to solve their problems. It appears the banking economy, the banking sector, found ways to solve the problems they had to deal with. But it seems they were not exported for huge financial gains like people will do in other economies. Why do you think we're not doing that enough in Nigeria? You know, it is an evolution. It's a growing economy, correct? So if you go back, you know, we, what we are doing is Nigeria is known for oil and gas. There's nothing beyond that, correct? Of course, uh, we had other natural assets, but the main focus, 80 to 90 percent is oil and gas. Now it is changing. Now technology is taking that place, correct? We say now, you know, data is a new oil, is correct? So it is we need to wait and wait, wait for a while to get these things correct. People are investing onto this, onto the technology. If you look at the fintech industry growth in Nigeria, it is really tremendous, correct? So that time frame, that breathing space has to be given even to investors and promoters and you know people getting into that industry. So that will take a little while, and I think um, maybe in another five years, we will be one of the biggest technology users and even service providers in the whole of Africa. Thank you, Thank you very much. So let's come home now to internet, data centers, data reservoirs, and analytics. Your company, Africa Data Centers, is at the heart of the internet. The internet is at the heart of everything we do in tech space now. And every single thing on the internet sits in data centers. So you are like, you host the internet. All of our data sits in your kind of businesses. Now, please tell us, um, the African landscape in terms of data and data centers, we hear all the time that internet capacity, maybe around West African coast, for example, it's in the neighborhood of 170 terabytes, but utilization is about 6%, less than 10% for sure. What are data centers doing to bridge this gap? Or are there other gaps that uh, infrastructure or some other players need to fix in order to really, really get this capacity into the hands of people? Exactly. It is a, it is a joint effort. Uh, Data centers, you know, we host data. You know, we are connected to submarine cables, other network operators. Let's take uh, Nigeria as a landscape. You know, all the six cables, the seventh one, every, everything is landing in Lagos, correct? From Lagos, we need to take the traffic to either Abuja or Kanu or Kaduna. 
the cost of that transmission is much much higher than the cost of Lagos to London. If that submarine trans, uh, traffic for one meg, uh, one meg is five dollars, for example, Lagos to Abuja is more than hundred dollars per meg. This is a capacity issue. There are so many projects which came up during the last five to ten years, but nothing took off from the ground the way it has to take off. So there is an, a smaller issue there that we all from the industry, not only the data centers, the service providers, everybody need to come and address it together. Otherwise what happens is uh, 24 million people in Lagos, maybe another uh, 8 million or 9 million in Potakot will have, you know, and Abuja, total 40 million peop uh, people in Nigeria will have an access to a good internet. So which is hardly... Um, any percentage of the overall population, correct? So 200 million population we are talking about, and we are talking about 40 million to have a right access or the right internet with the right uh, technicalities or however we say it. So there's a huge difference on that. So we need to look at how we can transport these capacities into other part of Nigeria at a cost-effective way so that a common man can use it. Because, okay, you may have a network when you travel out, but the quality of the network is very bad. I know uh, we, we see 3G on the mobile, but if you, you can't even open a simple page. If you leave the state capital, then there's nothing. So the, 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 there is a disparity between what is available in Lagos, uh, maybe Abuja and Patakot, and other part of the, the whole country. And that is the main part of the country, actually, correct? You are talking about 70% is left out, or 60%. You know, Dr. Krish, let, let me, the, the two things you have said that I would, I would like to push the envelope in terms of the conversation, but I'll take the first. Yes. But the second is capacity. So I, I'll come back to capacity in a bit. Now, let, let's stay on penetration and access. Nigeria and most part of Africa is very similar with where you come from, India and a lot of part of Asia. Internet penetration in most part of Europe is in the la later part of the 90%, 98, 96% and so on. The global average is about 63%. Nigeria is 50. Um, southern part of Africa is 63, 64. Now, if, if we look at the driver, what is making people invest in capacity to push internet access into land? What's driving the rest of the world to make this capacity available? Is it government policies? Is it the economics of internet availability? Or a combination of the two? I say this because you, you made the point. Government have made attempts again and again to invest or put policy and sometimes cash back to make this penetration available, broadband penetration, they will call it in Nigeria, most part of Africa. What is wrong? How do we fix this? What are others doing? What's driving it elsewhere? See, uh, government anywhere is an enabler. So you don't expect a final outcome from the government. Government simply enables you what you need to do. This is my thinking though. Private sector players need to come in place, correct? They know the value of this. They know the value of data. Okay, if you're talking about uh, six submarine cables landing in Nigeria, so many terabyte of bandwidth, and uh, so many millions of population, of active population, correct? And again, that population is with the range of 25 to 35 is the age group. That means majority of them are always online, or trying to be online, rather. And then if you look on the other side, more than 60% of the content or 65% of the content is hosted outside Nigeria. So this is the issues we need to look at it. So people like us who provide data center services along with the operate network operators come together and see that how best we can host these contents locally and make it accessible in a much better way to the common citizens. So that is a business goal. But as I said, 
government can enable it. Okay, government can give me a tax free or whatever is that, you know, based on policies, they can help us, support us, but not beyond that. So we from the sec private sector need to really drive it. Again, you, you, before we go to capacity, you, you just mentioned the concept of hosting and data sovereignty, uh, data confidentiality, a lot of policies and laws and regulation depending on where uh, countries and continents are along this journey. In Nigeria and most part of Africa, we are still at a regulation and policy framework stage um, while laws are being worked out. But clearly in Nigeria, for example, the government have pronounced again and again that data for Nigerians, generated in Nigerians, the data of Nigeria, especially public interest data, should reside in Nigeria. Do you think with the work your organization is doing and other people in that sector, do we have enough capacity and infrastructure for government and private sector players to keep their data in country, host all their services in country? See, this infrastructure is an, uh, you know, we need to build it. There are infrastructures available, but is that sufficient? Um, I don't think so it is sufficient. We need to build it. People are there coming into data center industry and the network industry, correct? So that is a process again. It is not uh, a regulation has come today, tomorrow morning this is happening. So maybe in another couple of years we should have more than enough capacity to handle our own traffic. So now let's go. Thank you for that. So what you're saying in essence, yes, the regulation is there, but um, like we say here, government needs to tamper justice with mercy. They, they need to allow time for people to, you know, comply and everything comes home. Um, let's go to capacity. You, you, you talked about capacity and, and the need for capacity to, to be available first in terms of making the infrastructure itself uh, available. But data, data center hosting data, it's more than infrastructure, isn't it? It's capacity, it's services, it's skills, soft skills and technical skills. Uh, do you see sufficient capacity in Nigeria and by extension Africa in, in your space to be able to get all of this done? Uh, and I will ask this um, perhaps also with the reality of what we see in your sector. Most telecoms players would bring in expatriates, especially at middle and senior levels, to home and lead a lot of Nigerian engineers and all of that. Have they, are they holding their own? Are they showing strength? Is the capacity growing in volumes and in the scale and level that you think is sustainable and Nigerians can indeed begin to play leadership roles in some of these, uh, providing some of these skills and services? See, uh, that is an issue of capacity. Uh, getting the right skill sets is really, really difficult. Uh, if you look at in the global scenario, we have more than 5,000 data centers. It is not Nigeria. Everywhere it is the same situation uh, of capacity. Uh, the thing what we need to look at is that train good people and try to onboard them and uh, that is quite possible uh, even as Africa data centers. Uh, we are also trying to have uh, a, a division which we can create capacity in various nations uh, so that that goes back into the society because people need to be educated, correct? In a data center, it is a very critical job. It's highly technical. So if you go and pull out a, a wrong wire, then everything goes down and eventually what you hear is a sorry. So you better avoid that sorry and train the right people. And uh, in Nigeria especially, it is quite possible because uh, the people are highly, highly talented. So, and what they like is a little direction. So... Okay. Let, me, let me ask this question, and I'm sure it will interest a lot of our young people. About six months ago, um, six months to 12 months ago, there were not a few global announcements about the appointment of Indian origin persons 
to be CEO of leading global tech firms, Google, Alphabet, IBM, uh, you know, so many of them. I think about 10 to a dozen of the top 30 tech companies have, have been led by people of Indian origin. Is there something about capacity development in India that Africa can replicate? I am sure a lot of our young people will like to see people of African origin. Am I speaking your mind? Speak people of Nigerian origin, be CEOs of global tech firms. How did India get to that point? You know, it is a sheer passion, you know, uh, passion towards the job, what you are doing. And uh, I really don't think anything is lacking on the Nigerian young, uh, young generation, uh, maybe an initial direction what they need on where to go and what to do. Uh, once that is given, I think, you know, sky is the limits for these guys. You know, you mentioned once, uh, you know, many of the companies get expatriates. Uh, my thinking is that, of course, there's a capacity. We come here, you know, and uh, try to develop things. At the same time, we also need to develop the nation and the local capacity. That is our role to play. It is not that develop ourselves. That is the secondary part here. The passion has to be develop the business, develop the country where you belong to or where you are present. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of our sort of socket generation, we move. The, the passion is there. I'm, I'm sure it just needs to be channeled in the right perspective. And um, yeah, maybe in another 10, 10, 15, 20 years, we'll begin to see. I'm sure a lot of them will want me to say five, but let's give it 10 years. We'll begin to see Nigerian CEOs uh, at, at global tech firms. I mean, apart from the ones that are of African origin, of course. Now, let's, let's talk about security real quick. Um, with data, there is always concerns around security. And if you continue to build data, like we said earlier, at the end of the day, everything on the internet sits in data centers. Uh, what are the concerns as users, as entrepreneurs, and as governments we should have about leaving and keeping our data in data centers? And what are data centers doing to address those concerns. Well, what are you doing, for example, in Africa data center? So, in any data center, you know, there are uh, critical security measures. Even to have an access to your data center, you need to pass through many security protocols. Forget about even getting into the data halls. Unless you are fully authorized, you cannot get into a data center or even to a data hall or even to access any customer equipments. It's not possible. But at the same time, you know, it, the security is a bigger word. It, it is not limiting into the physical security. It goes into cyber security. It goes into other aspects. Certain aspects remains with in our own hands. It is a, I'm sorry to use this word. It's a, it's a bit of uh, use of the right sense. When you see an email saying that, okay, click over here, you get 40 million or 50 million dollars. Why are you going and doing that? you are very sure that you are not going to get it. So it is a matter of, uh, you know, a bit of sensible approach uh, towards things. So don't, wrong, don't fall into, you know, or don't get a, be a victim of wrong things. So it is not all limiting to the uh, infrastructure provider. It, it, it circulates with everybody. Excellent. Um, l let me ask you one, one more question. Uh, I would ask the audience, this is a fireside chat. Normally, we shouldn't take questions, but I see a lot of young people nodding as we go along, so maybe we'll take one question from the audience. But still on security, um, I'm not sure this scenario has happened. At least not, I've not seen any in Africa. But there is a native fear in people that if you keep your data and your services, within the reach of perhaps government and for whatever reason the government choose to want to shut you down deal with you or whatever and all your services are hosted in a data center within that territory the government could simply come in and mandate the 
data center host provider to shut you down. Should you, for example, have your data center in Lagos, you have one in Lagos and you have another part of Africa. Suppose the Nigerian government comes and says one of your customers uh, is suspected of whatever and they want you to A, shut down their services or release all their data. Is it something a data center provider will typically just comply with? Or are there certain things that will give comfort? Because these are some of the sentiments that make things like blockchain, cryptocurrency, and so on very famous. Because it gives people some comfort that their data, their transaction is in the hands of third party out of the reach of government or people who can just clap on them easily. Can you give some comfort and, and what happens in that kind of scenario? You know, in some of those cases, there are, of course, there are uh, local regulations and global regulations. No data center gives an access to anybody on that, unless otherwise there are valid orders. Okay, these orders, okay, there are issues, correct? Okay, for example, uh, maybe FBI is investigating a case and they need access to something. They don't just come into any data center and knock the doors. They need, need to come through the proper channel with valid documentations and validations. Then the company decides to do it or not. Because of course, if it is a criminal proceedings or anything which is related to national security, then you may have to really think about it in a better view. Thank you very much. Now, let, let's talk quickly about analytics and then we take a question. Uh, I know there is an analytics part of this. At the end of the day, analytics is about rendering data, letting uh, people make sense of data and, and all of that. Just a quick thought. What, what's, what's your thought around the direction and what analytics is doing for people in terms of embracing and, and using data and, and adopting data center services? See, uh, on the side of Africa data centers, you know, we don't really handle uh, into that part. But in general, okay, analytics is needed because it gives you a behavior analysis of what you do as an individual. Of course, which will help a lot of e-commerce and fintech firms on how to manage their clients in a proper way because if you're going to Amazon and buying a particular type of perfumes or dresses so that becomes a notable thing so when you go to Amazon next time it pops up and says that you know these are the new methodologies or new things which is available so those kind of things can be uh, done but uh, it has its own plus as well as minus the plus is that you get to the latest in the market the minus is that somebody is always monitoring you <laughs> so that is the minus part of it all right, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Krish. It's, it's been a privilege and an honor talking to you. Uh, I would like to see by indication of hand, uh, those who would just like to ask a question, if there is any, or otherwise I, I would like to just take a parting shot. I, I saw a gentleman raise his hand earlier. Okay, change your... All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Krish. It's my privilege to spend time with you and, and talk about data center reservoir and analytics. I'm, I'm particularly excited to, to share and know that you are uh, an Indian Nigerian and, and you share a lot of uh, pedigree and, and, and journey with us. Thank you and wish you all the best in your data center journey in Nigeria. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, since I'm still up here, I'll just uh, take the initiative and
invite the next set of panelists. Uh, I don't know if the moderator is If I may, I would just like to quickly Hello? Okay. So the next session is starting just now. Uh Check. please thank you I, i'd like to invite mr dumebi obodo to the stage mr dumebi obodo is the managing director of charms access one of the subsidiaries of charms plc maybe please i would uh, quickly call out those that will be on this panel uh, as i call you please come join dumebi as i leave the stage uh, mr khalil halilu is a tech premium and industrialist founder ceo of the cans and sharp sharp then patrick gary please give them a round of applause as they come up patrick gary is ceo and founder of the five air in dubai i, I, I hope i got that right solomon o Ayodele is head innovation at alat by wemer bank at wemer bank plc Please uh, give them a round of applause. Maybe over to you, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, are we still, Bosu? Are we still expecting other panelists? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, well, you're very much welcome. Um, our topic of discussion today is something that is straightforward and uh, it will be interesting to have um, your thoughts and you will also make it as, uh, as entertaining as possible. Uh, my name is Dumebi Obodo. Um, I'll be the moderator of this session. Um, I will yield the microphone to the panelists uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, please, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Okay. <laughs> My name is Fela, Fela Olagunju. I'm the Chief Good Officer at Bankly. Bankly is a digital banking and uh, financial services uh, company. I've uh, been around since 2018. And our mission is just to provide efficient and simple financial services to the last mile. Uh, it's interesting being here. I look forward to speaking with everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. By my left. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Khalil Halilu. I'm a technology entrepreneur uh, and founder of the Cannes Technology Hub, where we build a community of uh, people building solutions around sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll jump right into, I think this is echoing quite well. we we'll jump right into We'll jump right into the topic of our discussion today. Um, cashless Africa. Is Africa taking the leap or lagging behind? 
Um, I'm aware, and many of us know, uh, some of the initiatives that CBN um, has taken since 2010 till date to entrench the cashless initiative in the country. Uh, other interesting products like Empesa and other products around Africa have also helped in the adoption of cashless uh, economy. Um, so what are your thoughts with respect to cashless initiatives in Africa? How well are we doing? Uh, would you, do you think, in your own view, that we are moving as fast as we should? Or there are a lot of other things that need to be done on cashless initiative? Please go ahead. Uh, so I'll, I'll start this way. I would say sometime in 2019, I lost my ATM card. I was in GT Bank. So I was in a state where I couldn't go quickly apply for a new card. So I said, hey, how will I start accessing cash? So I went through my app and I saw GT Bank has this feature called pay code, where you can generate a code, then go to any machine and take out cash. So I tried, I tried it and it worked. I got a 10 digit code went to the machine, I punched it in, and the cash came out. You know, I've been in tech for a while, but even for me, that, that tripped me a lot. Because even people at the machine kept saying, when I took the cash and they say, uh, Oga, you're, you, you forget your card. I'm like, don't worry, it's cashless. And that really sounded good. I like, if Nigeria is getting here, then we are really going somewhere. So guess what? I was like that for two, three years. I didn't bother going to get a card at all. So sometimes it was good, it was good, but sometimes it used to leave me hanging. For instance, I don't have a card, I do the code, I go to the machine, and there's an error or there's an issue. So that means I'm stranded. You know, so I'll be able to paint the picture of what the cashless economy is already getting into, the challenges that we might have. But for presently, I would say we are getting closer to where we should be. Countries like Kenya, you, if you go to Kenya, you see they have it. Even the guy pushing the, 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 the truck, he can take money from you by mobile money. You just get his number, you transfer, it's really easy. But for us in Nigeria, we believe our cash is king. It's, it's uh, for instance, the guy selling meat or cow, he makes one million a day. He would feel, why would he go put his money somewhere in the bank when he wants to put it somewhere that he can see? So we've not gotten there because our mobile penetration and everything hasn't got to the level we want to be. But at the time we get there, I feel like cashless transactions would be the best way to go. Why? Because it increases, uh, there's more security for your cash, there's more transparency. For instance, you have uh, staff, your staff, they are doing cash, you can see the trail of the money. Money is not exchanging hands, and I feel like that's where, where we should be. So very soon, we'll, we'll get there with the amount of, uh, with the, the rate at which technology is, a, is, is improving. Thank you very much. Halim? It would be nice to have your thoughts and uh, also it would be nice to tell us if there are additional measures you think that the government needs to put in place to improve the adoption of cashless initiatives. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Well, um, I don't think that Africa is lagging behind, you know, in terms of uh, uh, cashless technology. Uh, today, Nigeria has one of the most advanced mobile banking in the world, you know, and also one of the fastest settlements. Uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, top three, you know. And um, even locally here, you can see the international banks don't have a room to compete, you know, in terms of uh, uh, mobile technology. Today, GT Bank or Access Bank or First Bank Mobile App is much, much better than uh, the likes of Standard Chartered Bank, you know. And even the steps that you take, uh, you know, to create a transaction, you know, because uh, they understand the environment. We have uh, infrastructural gaps, and they're able to build tech solutions that have adopted to, you know, the realities on ground. Um, long ago, uh, with the introduction of mobile phone, a lot of people uh, didn't even see opportunity to have mobile phones in Africa, you know. Uh, and the simple reason was we don't even have enough landline penetration. So why are we talking about uh, mobile phones, you know? Uh, but today, one of the biggest market for mobile phones is uh, Africa. And you can see how it has leapfrogged 
you know, from landline uh, straight into um, uh, GSM. So uh, definitely there are opportunities, and uh, M-Pesa is one of the, you know, most uh, recognizable uh, solutions out there in the world, not just in Africa. And we begin to see more of that. There are more fintechs churning out in Africa uh, at a higher speed than any uh, part of the world, you know. So uh, the future is bright in terms of that. What I think government needs to do uh, to accelerate this is basically to provide the right infrastructure, you know. Uh, and you're talking about internet, you're talking about uh, 3G uh, coverage, 4G coverage, you know, and the likes. Uh, the good news is uh, we have the likes of Starlink, you know, coming into Nigeria, where we'll sort of eliminate some of the bottlenecks around uh, infrastructure and penetration of, uh, you know, technologies that uh, these kind of solutions leverage on. Uh, so I strongly believe that, you know, we're getting there and typically for things that in other parts of the world is a want, you know, now in Nigeria it becomes a need. For example, if you talk about WhatsApp, if you do business as SMEs, it's is, is a need, you know. Um, you almost cannot operate, uh, you know, without WhatsApp because all the customers are now, have adopted to, you know, transaction via chat and are always looking forward to, uh, you know, doing so. Um, so uh, definitely there are opportunities. Uh, there is a leapfrog opportunity, and I see the future bright, you know, for Africa as far as these uh, technologies are concerned. Thank you very much. That's quite, um, that's quite straight based on your explanations. Um, but I was wondering, um, of late we've seen the Central Bank of Nigeria um, introducing the e Naira platform. Uh, we've seen USSD um, platforms introduced by different banks. Uh, some are also powered by NIPS. And one wonders uh, why there hasn't been significant uptick in terms of cashless. Uh, cashless initiatives by the bottom of the pyramid players. Uh, what are your thoughts with respect to onboarding uh, folks in the bottom of the pyramid space and what are the things you think need to be done from the socio-economic side, from the financial inclusion side, from the policy side and the less? Ali? Okay, I think across board, what needs to be done is to have proper incentive plan, okay? Uh, money is a necessity, or means of transaction is a necessity, you know. Uh, but as a trader, or as a business person, or as a consumer, what the government needs to do is to clearly map out uh, incentives where I will look forward more to uh, going cashless, you know, uh, than having paper-based uh, money. And also encourage uh, startups, you know, that are building solutions to move the economy into, a, you know, a cashless economy. Uh, yes, there has been the issue of ERI is done by the government, uh, but really, central bank's role is not in retail. You know, it's more of on a regulatory end, and they're jumping into retail. Uh, what I would have preferred is if they encourage, uh, you know, startups that are dynamic, you know, that are robust, you know, that can take much higher risks than they do and just put uh, policies and simple guidelines, you know, to enable them to uh, build products that will take us to the dreamland. Okay, please yeah, go ahead. Um, Your talking about the, the in era, well, if you look at the, the cost of a phone, it's, uh, it's not something a lot of people can afford at the, at the last mile. You know, the cost of a phone, network itches in those areas, then uh, awareness. All of us here, we have DSTV, we have NT, we have all of that. We can see what CBN is doing. We can say, well, let's even try this in there. But that guy in Yola, in Damaturu, he might not be able to afford a phone that will be able to give him what he wants. And also, there's no awareness, deep awareness in that area. And even if those of them that are able to be, they are aware and they have money to buy the phones, they, how to use those technology is not easily accessible to them. I feel that's the those are the three reasons for the, the slowness in adopting most of these digital technologies, like the in era and other initiatives that have been that have been coming out. 
Okay, thank you very much. I was also wondering, um, considering that um, Africa is fairly homogeneous in terms of our social, uh, socio-economic landscape, right? Um, one wonders why you have varied uh, adoption of cashless initiatives. So what you see in Kenya is completely different in terms of adoption uh, from what you see in Nigeria. Uh, you go to South Africa, you go to Namibia, you go to uh, other West African countries. So in your view, what do you think uh, can be done in this regard to bridge this gap? Because obviously uh, there, are, there seem to be some uh, discrepancies in terms of adoption, you know. So, what are your thoughts? Thanks. Okay, about that, I'll say uh, focus goes usually where your attention goes, you know. So, in a country like uh, Cameroon, for example, mobile money is, is really big. If you go in there, you can do your USSD withdrawal cash. But guess what? Your cards won't work. So, when I was in Cameroon, my all my ATM, go Visa and MasterCard didn't work on any of their, their terminals. So I was, I was stranded. Even the mobile money wasn't like, you can't do like a Nigerian transfer to them. You know, so I feel like in countries like Cameroon and Kenya, probably from the beginning, they had prioritized that uh, mobile money tr um, channel for them because they felt, okay, um, we don't have that uh, very heavy, strong banking infrastructure like Nigeria. Okay, this USSD mobile money channel, real quick, we have everybody on it. But Nigeria basically started from the, from the banking, not from the telecoms angle, you know, for our transactions. So I feel it, right now, for example, you'd see the MTN, every, all the telecoms rolling out their, their uh, mobile money uh, platforms. So now attention is going to this part. So that's where you see very soon uh, both Nigeria, Kenya, everybody will catch up. Kenya and Cameroon will catch up with using cards and ATMs, and Nigeria also will catch up with using these uh, digital technologies like uh, mobile, mobile money. Thank you very much. So, Kali, let me come back to you. Um, the last speaker talked about the PSBs, the uh, telcos trying to get into the fray. The banking, um, bank, bank, the banks have been pushing the the uptake of cashless, now that the um, telcos are getting into the free, what do you see? Um, interestingly, these telcos also operate across Africa, so they can, they, they, are, they are a factor uh, in terms of deciding the uptake, um, financial inclusion, cashless initiatives and the likes. What are your thoughts now that you have telcos trying to play uh, in the space of uh, financial inclusion, cashless initiatives through the MOMO and all those agency banking. What are your thoughts? Well, um, there has been a lot of, you know, back and forth, you know, uh, whether telcos should even go into this fintech because some banks see them as a threat. Um, but I think there's still there are a lot there's a lot more that needs to be done in Africa generally you know as far as uh, capturing the unbanked you know and the telcos are already there by mere of you know uh, virtual operations and they already have these people within their ecosystem you know which they can easily convert but one thing is policy can come into play because most of these transactions you see that they are lower tier accounts you know it's not a kind of account that you know you do a million naira transaction even in a day. So there are micro, you know, activities hap happening. So I think regulation needs to come into play to see how both of them can support each other, you know, uh, and ride on the back of uh, each other to complement. Because uh, we should be far away from competition. You know, we need to consolidate and collaborate to see how we can crack, you know, uh, this untapped market. Uh, before even talking about competition. It's a little bit unhealthy now, and I think this is where government needs to come in and play. And Government not just on a country level, but uh, on, on a continent basis level. How do we synchronize policies to make it easier for fintechs to scale? You've seen the likes of Paystack, Flutter, you're having multiple footprints uh, across Africa. 
uh, telcos, a lot of them are, are there. Uh, but also how do we have uh, switches and windows where, uh, you know, there can easily be conversions uh, in terms of currencies, in terms of uh, flow of uh, money. Because uh, even when you are taking our flights, you know, sometimes it's cheaper to fly out of Africa and connect from an external uh, hub, you know, back into Africa, you know. So uh, this is a big problem and you can see clearly the solution is around collaboration and uh, policies need to come into place. How do we have a general handshake uh, on a continent uh, level, you know, to be able to achieve this? Uh, I'd like to say something too about this uh, payment service. So uh, at Bankly, we, when we heard MTN was basically going into our space too. Uh, people were asking me, ah, fella, how will, your, how will your company react to MTN? MTN, they are like too big. Like, feels like there's no competition. I'm like, for us at Bankly, we look not to compete, but we look to partner. So I started thinking to myself, what are the things that MTN can't do that MTN will need Bankly for? You know, your payment service license enables you to do payments, but it also enables you to do other things. You can't do savings, you can't do micro insurance, you can't do those things. And those are the things that are the core to our business. So when I see MTN and Airtel and, and, and all these guys coming out, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because they have the distribution network that I need. So if we look at it in those terms that, hey, we are not competing, hey, you're my guy, come, what market do you have that I can sell to? I feel that's how the Jews make a lot of money. Uh, in, in, the Jewish people, if someone is selling bread, the next Jew, he won't open a bread shop beside the guy. He said he will open a beans shop or a tea shop so you can go and buy bread here then go over there and buy tea and eat your food so i feel if we start looking at it in that um, angle uh it would be no nobody be worried about this guy doing this and that guy doing that that's those are my thoughts thank you very much um ju just just to mention um halil in one of his submissions talked about uh regulation coming from two, three different bodies. Uh, now, we are referring to Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is 200 million markets, right? So anything that concerns Africa substantially will affect Nigeria and vice versa. Um, in view of the fact that CBN gives licenses for agency banking, for, for microfinance, banking, for other financial uh, services, banking, um, cooperatives and the likes. Um, and then you see uh, the communications uh, ministry coming up with the startup bill, right? And then you find out that some of the startups are fintechs, right? Now, that bill will be regulated once it comes into full force by the sponsors of the bill. What do you see? Uh, what do you see could happen if it's not well managed? Uh, you have the telcos playing, telcos are regulated by NCC. So you have three bodies. So what do you see uh, could happen? And what are the things you suggest that needs to happen? And then also from the African perspective, do you think there needs to be uh, policies that cut across in terms of uh, in, um, entrenching and uh, increasing adoption for cashless initiative. Okay, great. On this uh, startup bill issue, uh, what I see is so far, if you notice, the bill hasn't been passed in full. It's been taking time. So you wonder, why is it taking time? Can I just pass it and let's, let's be done with it? Well, it's taking time because they are going around the country doing town hall meetings, in sensitizing everybody, taking opinion from here and here so that the bill will be holistic enough in a way that it doesn't, uh, it, it, is there something I don't know? <laughs> okay. That the bill is holistic enough so it cuts across, like you said. It, the government can just sit at the top and just say, you know what, this is, the, this is what we think, we just pass the bill. But they're going to try to every state, state by state, doing town hall meetings, getting feedback from all the players, seeing how it can favor everyone across across board so i'm sure they will be very intentional about that too because the telcos are involved in the planning it won't just tilt towards um paying a more advantage to them they'll try to make it in a way that is going to be 
across and they are pulling in the youth himself uh, I'll, even they, I'd like to mention someone Tracy Uloma she's doing something really good in the startup bill and uh, she's, uh, she's like one of us youth like her so I feel they are pulling in all the important stakeholders that will make the bill holistic enough so there will be no one feeling left out that's what I think yeah. thank you very much um, I don't know organizers I don't know if Dr. Yele is able to dial in Hello? Is Dr. Yele able to dial in? Dr. Yele, one of the panelists, is he able to dial in? Okay, okay. So we'll just continue. Okay, um, it would be nice to have your, it would be nice, Hali, to have your final thoughts on the topic, uh, cashless initiative, uh, how is Africa faring? Are we lagging or are we adopting as fast as we should? Your final thoughts. I'm positive about the future of Africa, you know, uh, more especially around technology. There's something that has stood out clearly. Uh, we're a very, very uh, localized environment, you know. And what I mean by that, if you look from our dressing, our music, it's something that is built by us, you know? Uh, and likewise, all solutions that have cut across sectors uh, is in that instance. Uh, but one thing needs to be clear, you know, uh, which is uh, collaboration. You know, there's so much opportunity. We, just, we haven't scratched the surface yet, uh, but collaboration is what will drive us forward. And we've seen a lot of that happening. You've seen the likes of Ecobank, Access Bank, operating across a lot of West African countries. Recently, Access Bank acquired one of the biggest uh, South African banks, you know. So it's a, it's a local play and it's an African play, uh, but a lot of collaboration needs to be uh, kicked into uh, place and uh, I, the, the future is bright, basically. Thank you. Your final thoughts? Okay. Uh, on collaboration, I feel like I support what you said so much. Uh, like I said, at Bankly, at the heart of our causes partnerships you know um, collaborating with the right uh, players collaborate with the right people so I'll give an example uh, we've empowered about 25,000 entrepreneurs around Nigeria with employment how because uh, we give them POS terminals to be agents in their location um, both merchants and agents and out of that 25,000 we have 8,000 of them that are women you know and we are pushing the limit to increase that to about 100,000 before the end of the year so how are we doing this partnership saying oh in that local government who is that player there that we know we can push so that it can deepen deepen our reach so i feel with the right partnerships with the right collaboration and most importantly with the right technology that is simple and straightforward enough to use i feel like uh, more people would uh, join the cashless the cashless uh, community that's my final thoughts Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at the end of, uh, we've come to the end of our session. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you so much. Welcome, Thank you sir. to the panelists. You're welcome. Thank you. Please, can we appreciate the panelists again? Thank you. Considering that we are almost rounding up for the day, I want to crave everyone's indulgence so that we can quickly go into the last panel and then we know we are done for the day. Do we lo do all agree? Okay, so I'm going to be inviting Mr. Boston Ayeni again. He is going to be um, moderating the panel on building and pushing Africa's content in the cyberspace. So I'd also like to invite the panelists. I will start with Oti Ukubenje, 
He is the Senior Vice President, Product for Tarragon Group. Then there is, I would also like to invite Nuruddin Abdallah, founder and editor of the 21st Century Chronicles. Stephen Angbulu, founder, Reader's Circle Book, Reader's Circle Book Club Africa. And then Mr. Smith Osemeke, the Managing Director, CEO, Unitellas International Limited. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as we start this panel, I would, I would like to please ask the facilitators, the organizers, to kindly ensure that every young person in this hall is seated at this conference. If possible, they should leave the exhibition stand and come sit at this session because this is the panel for young people this is the panel of the young for the young by the young so it's extremely important that um, so ushers uh, ushers kindly ensure everyone comes in and a part of this panel so on that note I would like to welcome you, gentlemen, to this session. Uh, my name again is Bosun Ayeni. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Compumetrics. I would quickly ask in 30 seconds that we just test our mics and introduce uh, ourselves, your name, and what you do in your organization. Uh, we, we start with you, Oti. Thank you. Hello, can you guys? Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, but so I was going to say this our panel is not, uh, it's not gender balanced. <laughs> Quite so. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Oti Ukube Inje. I am the Senior Vice President for Products at Terragon Limited. Terragon is a data and marketing technology company headquartered in Lagos and operating in five other countries in Africa. And uh, we focus on building marketing technology software to drive business growth using data. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, the other gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Oti. Go ahead. I'm Nuruddin Abdullah, a journalist and media entrepreneur. I'm the editor of 21st Century Chronicle. We are a newspaper organization. We do media training, reputation management. What a few. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Abdallah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Angulu. I currently work as State House correspondent for the Punch newspapers. My name, thank you everyone. My name is um, Smith Osemeke. I'm the MD Unitelux, promoting edge cloud service in Nigeria and the whole of Africa. Smith, you're welcome. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daphne Rogi. I'm the Chief Technical Officer for Unitelux, and I'm sure uh, you have a very nice day today. We'll be able to introduce our product and uh, enlighten you on the steps so far we've taken in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Dafe. You're welcome. So uh, as we, as we kickstart, ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, like to just start by saying building and pushing content 
is something we are all familiar with. In fact, it's something that has become almost as native as speaking to the new and young generation. We all have memes and skits and all sorts of content created by people as young as six months old, 12 months old, that go viral on the internet now. So it therefore gives me great joy to see that something that 12 month old children or kids, babies, uh, are familiar with, an 100 year old woman, there is a woman that passed on recently in Nigeria, that I'm not sure what her age was, but she, she was an internet sensation. Uh, passed on perhaps last month or so, or this month. Uh, I'm sure she's in her late 80s or 90s. So this is what we are talking about. Something several generations, at least one thing we can all agree to, that several generations of people see the same way, use the same way, embrace the same way. So, gentlemen, tell me, what is it? I, I, I'll start with you, uh, Oti. What is it about media, now specifically social media, that makes it appeal to such a vast generation of people? Thank you, Bosu. Um, I would narrow it down to two things. Um, and it's sort of tied to the mission of uh, a platform like Facebook which is around uh, building communities uh, and fostering relationships. So as human beings, um, we have two um, innate desires that we find any opportunity to fulfill. The first one is the need to establish relationship, either on a one-to-one -one basis or on a one-to-many basis. So personal relationships or community building type of relationships where you find people of common purpose. Um, so even if there was no social media, human beings will still find ways to express this particular innate desire, whether it's in your church, your local community, or if just in a bar where you're sitting drinking with people. And then when you look into those communities, there is one innate uh, characteristics of every member of that community, the need or desire to be heard. Nobody just wants to stay completely in the shadows. Even though we want to be heard at different levels, maybe when you find people that are at your level, you can speak, but once you're out of that comfort zone, you're quiet. But we always find where we can air our opinion. So that, that phrase, who asks you? Well, nobody asks me. We just know how to give opinions. Social media is built around these two tenets, community and relationship building, and the need to be heard. So if you look at all social platforms, they always have these two functions baked into it. Speak even though nobody asked, and then interact with people for feedback to build relationships. I would say that's why it is common across generations, because it's, it's a response to a human phenomenon. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Oti. Now, uh, Emilukon, it is my turn to be heard. Uh, so I, I would ask, uh, the, the next question I will take to you, uh, Ab Abdallah. People want to be heard. People want to interact and build relationships. You have always worked in places or environment, and now, now creating an environment where people are heard. Uh, as a journalist, you live the life where you speak even when you are not asked. And sometimes even when they say, off your mic, off your mic, off your mic, you still want to speak. Now, in the concept of speaking and especially comparing traditional journalism with the social media and the media, well, social media effect globally, how do you see the relationships and the divergence between a traditional journalist 
and those who are creating and disseminating information on social media today? Thank you very much. Uh, actually, there is a, a sort of a migration between what we call the old media to the new media, particularly using these platforms you have mentioned. You know, uh, principally, you know, we have Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Telegram, and so on and so forth. And again, you know, fundamentally, uh, communication is key. Even, you know, we are religious people. Um, God sent prophets to communicate to his servants, you know, from Adam down to Prophet Muhammad. So it's key. And f you have to use the available means to reach out your, to your audience. And now that's why social media is key. Let me just give you an instance. During the last days of uh, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, he granted interview to two media organizations, BBC and ABC News. But you know what we saw, particularly if you watch CNN and what a few, we thought that it was only Christian among poor that interviewed the man. Whereas he was working for ABC at that time. No, the bureau chief of CNN in North Africa was equally there. She only tweeted about to interview Libya's strongman, Muammar Gaddafi, and it went viral. Many people thought that it was only Amampo that interviewed him, whereas it was uh, the bureau chief of the BBC was there. BBC in this part of the world is even more popular than the ABC News. That's the power of the social media. Just recently, uh, President of the United States, he took Twitter to the highest level. He was communicating policies of the biggest, uh, the strongest nation on earth, Twitter, for instance. So, you know, before now, when you see anything on Twitter or Facebook page of a minister, you don't take it seriously. But now, when Trump came, you know, he took it to that uh, level. And at the same time, the audience, most Nigerians, for instance, now, say more than 65% are young men the power of this. So they don't have time to go and buy the newspaper. Uh, perhaps even the newspaper now look at the, the dollar exchange. So expensive, you have to import the newsprint, import the ink, import spare parts, chemicals, and what if you. So now the audience have migrated to social media. And in business, you migrate with your audience. You give your customers what they want. If you like, I look at even the print. I remember in Daily Trust at the time, we are printing up to 25,000 copies daily. But now the thing has shrunk to less than 10,000 because of the cost. If you pick it at that time, you'll see it is bulky, 64 pages minimum. Now they are even publishing 28 pages because of the cost. The only thing I would say maybe the social media angle is the audience migrated from the traditional to the new media, but the advertisers remain with the old media. So that's the, the challenge now, you know. And you know, uh, like uh, Mr. Aini said, the only thing Nigerians subscribe to is DSTV. <laughs> you don't want to subscribe to online platforms to get the news, you know, and analysis, and, and what's happening? So, you know, this is the current trend now. But, you know, like you said, we have to evolve ways of striking an equilibrium. We have to survive. Our audience needs to be informed, and you have to give them quality products. So it's a continuous uh, process. <laughs> Let me step here for now. Well, thank you. The, the maxim of the old versus new is something that is as old as mankind it, it's always uh, something new is always on the horizon yeah. and I'm sure for as long as we continue to evolve there would always be new things challenging the old I'm talking about new things and old reading uh, reading is something we've always done in different formats reading is akin to learning learning is as old as mankind but the concepts of illustrating and documenting things and then assimilating them at a later stage 
uh, first evolved and migrated into the concept of documenting things on different media, then came down the line books. And as they evolved into books, the concept of reading books became global. But now the way we read, people want to read a full book, perhaps in a 60 minute audio or a summary version of the same book. So I, I would like to ask Mr. Stephen, Stephen Angulu, what has your experience been? You founded and run the book club, a book club where you consume content created by people. Is it true that members of your club are migrating from the old media to the new media? And the idea of reading itself, is it still with us as it used to be? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, first, I will start by saying that reading is as old, like you rightly said, reading is as old as humans and is as old as learning itself. Now, uh, the question of whether or not reading or people, my community, have migrated from the old media into the new media, I think it started with the orientation. First, I run a, read, a reading club, like you rightly said. We're over 2,000 members now. And every month, we pick one book along a particular line of topic to study, right? And then we go over the book at the end of the month, like this is the end of June, so we're expecting our next review coming up in a few days. One of the things that has stuck with me doing this over the years is that there will always be the evolving of medium or the how of what people learn but there would never be a time where we outgrow the need to learn from the lessons and the lives of other people for instance biographies biographies give people the opportunity to live multiple lifetimes in one and that advantage alone makes reading worthwhile now talking about the mediums of course, people, most people would not have the luxury. I call it a luxury because it's truly one. Luxury of sitting down with a hardcover book or a paperback book to read it from back to back. And that's okay. And that's what I tell my, my clients, most of the people I coach, busy experts, busy professional people. And I tell them, you don't have to read it in ink and pulp. There's new media today, like my colleague just said. Audio books are here to stay, whether we like it or not, okay? So we can leverage audio books, we can leverage other electronic formats of studying. I'm, particularly, I'm particular about audio books because it gives people the opportunity to multitask, since that's what we love to do today. Many people believe and think that s sitting down with a book, you know, opening it and then reading it full concentration is rubbing off of something else and that's true in a way because reading demands something from us it demands focus it demands leaving every other thing and focusing on this one book few extra pages for a certain period of time but many people are not willing to pay that price they want to eat their cake and have it and i'm saying fine you can still eat your cake and have it go for audio books go for book summaries on youtube right or online Thank you very much. Steve, you just got a new, a few new members of to your club. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I, I'd like to go to Smith now. Um, you know, I, I like the way Steve put it, that in order for people to read and consume content. There are people who help put some of these things in place, help to create the environment, the infrastructure, the systems, or the printing machines, whatever it is, to make this printing possible. So what I will do, I'll, I'll make this a two-part question. Uh, Steve, you take the first part, and then Daphne will take the second. 
all right so so that we just take it um, in, a, in a in one clean sweep so the first part of the question is how difficult is it how increasingly difficult or easy is it getting to help create some of this support infrastructure to help people build content whether it's traditional media online which, whichever one and then the, the second part would be what and that will be for Daffy what part of content building today in terms of infrastructure do you think people should be focusing on and why and if you could just explain that. So the first is how difficult, and that will be for you, uh, um, Smith, how difficult is it or easier for people to begin to provide the infrastructure or, or, or for creating content today? And for you, Dafe, would be okay. where should really be people be focusing on today and why? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So if we... Um look at um, talking about content and also reading content we talk about where the platform in which this contents uh, is going to be and how are people going to access this content so it matters a lot because in a situation whereby this uh, content are put in the cloud or maybe so that everyone can be able to have access to it. And maybe when you try to have access to a content you want to consume, and um, you discover that um, time taking to even open the content uh, is already difficult, you see, you want to go out of that page and look for you know, somewhere to read where you can get a faster um, uh, um, the application opening faster. So you see a lot of people putting information in the social media, but they are not getting that audience or people who comes to read it because it just takes us seconds to see if this, I can read this. And if I see it buffing, I just want to go out, out of that page. So, and that is what we see around today. People create content, fantastic, good content, and they put it there in the social media. But the question is the application in which you are actually using to promote this content, uh, where is it located? Is it within my reach? Or is it something I have to travel? When I say travel, you know, I can be here and also be in America at the same time. You know, so I can know what is happening in America, just the question of logging in. So how fast will I get that information if I really want? So that is where latency comes in, and it frustrates us when we try to get this information, and we see it buffering, you know. Why? Because the content is located miles, thousands of miles away, and I'm here trying to retrieve it to read or to look at. So what, to make it easier, we have provided an enabling environment for content providers, to make sure that they host this content local so that we can bring us the, the, the lowest latency ever. You know, it's just like, let me use the example of Google. Google is one of the most visited website in the world today. So what do Google do? Then we know that for us, 2000 and maybe 2000, 2000 1999, trying to go into Google, you know what we suffer. You need to go to Cyber Cafe and uh, you type Google. Once you type Google, you can leave it there, it's buffing, you can go and buy something, it's still, sorry, it's still buffing, you still come back, you are waiting for Google to open. So it's not like that today. What did Google do? Google have to see that, okay, can we bring our servers located where this data is being generated? So like in Nigeria, they have to bring their server here in Nigeria and put it. And that is why you see, when you type Google, as soon as you press search, it brings you, within a second, it brings you because the server is located here. So we have also provided enabling environment by providing over five cloud. So we are supporting cloud MSPs, managed service provider. We know that to build these infrastructures is not cheap. Just we are talking about over $5 million worth of infrastructure. So that is why you see most of our content, because we don't have what it takes to host this locally, 
we, it affected me as a businessman when I started my IoT business. So I discovered that there's going to be a lot of latency, you know, people trying to get the real-time data. So I have to look at how do I get server. Servers are very expensive, storage very expensive. So we come across with a, a partner who can offer us infrastructure, IT, native, cloud native infrastructure as a service, and we have to ship it down, install, and put our services local. And we took it as a business to also support cloud service providers in Nigeria. So instead of them spending millions of dollars to come into this business, we provide them the infrastructure hardware infrastructure, cloud native infrastructure locally without them spending any capex so that Nigerians can be able to host their content. And also those who provide software applications in different ways, they are able to host exactly the kind of experience they can get in public cloud like in AWS local here. So this is what Unitelas is doing to make it easy for content providers. Uh, thank, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Daffy, you want to have some? Uh, yes. So, just as Smith has said, and uh, if I also tie that back to your earlier question to me, uh, which basically goes around how do content get created? Uh, so, today we are seeing two trends here where people stream this content directly. I mean, you go to CNN.com and you want to see the latest news, or a friend on the next street or somebody you do not know prepare a small podcast puts it on whatsapp and there you go so which takes us back again to the traditional media where people have to have big studios to prepare contents people have to have specialized applications to prepare content so we are seeing a sort of uh, i'll put it rebellion today so which means that I can be a, a newscaster. I don't have to have so much infrastructure in place with my phone. However, that's more of a decentralized content. So you produce this content, do you have it structured, streamlined, organized, such that we can fall back to it in 10 years' time and say, this is your work. You know, over 10 years, you've been preparing this, this, this content. So as uh, Steve said, biography, right? So you want to prepare a documentation of what people have done. So today you're beginning to see applications like TikTok, you know, coming up and becoming very, very important. The Instagrams, these are all pioneers and uh, uh, major stakeholders within the new media which we are talking of today. However, for us in, in, in Unitellers, as uh, Smith said, so we have we understand what it takes to have infrastructure to, to host, to organize your content. And that is the gap we are filling today within the Nigerian space. Such that you could have smaller players without spending too much, having that ability to have a structured media where you can streamline your content, maybe it's... Uh, video on demand, or whatever services you want to. Even the regular text media, for instance, the regular print media. We can assist you also uh, through our platform in itself. Thank, thank you very much, Daffy. Uh, that, that's a lot of work. Thank you for the work you're doing to improve the infrastructure, uh, bridge the infrastructure challenge. Uh, I, I'd like to dive in a bit closer in on building content because this is the first part of of our theme really now in, in building content uh, i would like to approach you from the perspective of those who are actually building the content uh, one would look at it and it will appear that there are several career paths to content building uh, I would like you, OT, to, to take us through the journey and the options available to someone who wants to be passionate, who is passionate, who wants to pursue a career, perhaps in building content. Uh, should you just sit in your village and, and build the content? Or are there real structured ways of, of doing this? 
Okay. Uh, I'm sure the journalists in the house uh, will be able to answer that question better. Uh, because well, he, yes, I, I'll come to the journalists, but, but I'd like Oti to share his thought first. He, you know, I, I don't want the journalists to just tell us about journalism. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, I think so. There is indeed a there is a whole content value chain that starts with the creation of the content. One of the most difficult to do that has now been simplified heavily by social media is that original storytelling, where you have a lot of these content creators today, the uh, Sabinus and Macaronis and all that, who have taken storytelling and content creation away from big studio mode into mobile phone driven type content creation and they're telling beautiful stories that we all love to consume today on social media and in some cases it's making its way to mainstream as well um, that has really democratized the ability for people to get into content creation because with a phone with yourself and your original story and social media, you have the content, the tools or technology to capture that content and sort of really subsidize means of hosting and distributing that content. If everybody was supposed to build their own social media platforms individually to promote their content, it will, it will not go anywhere. But these platforms exist for us to now aggregate this content and everybody has access to it. So it solves a lot of the value chain problem from distribution to engagement to analytics and all that. Then when you come into the other area of um, telling third party stories, for me I feel that's where a lot of professionalism comes in. So many platforms have existed to try and democratize journalism, for example. I, I used to work with Opera Software in the past. When we launched Opera News, we tried to democratize journalism by saying, everybody come and create your account, tell stories the way you are seeing it happen in different parts of Nigeria. But that platform suffered from things like terrible English, false news, and all that. So that part of content creation, I would say, it's, it still requires a lot of professional effort and it's not for everybody, let me put it that way, right? And that's why today you have social media and suddenly you have fake news everywhere because the easier, the way, when you drop the barrier for people to enter that level of content creation or storytelling, then it creates room for all the nonsense we're dealing with today. The part that I say for anybody who's looking to get into con the business of content today and you don't have or you don't know how to tell your own stories you're not a journalist by profession or nature i'll tell you what's more exciting for consumers today there's so much content we don't know where to go and look for all the content we want it but we don't know where to look if i tell you go into google today and search you will start here and you end up here because you just get carried away with different type of content so there is a whole business around people who are just pulling content together to amuse people. So for example, there's something, there's a, there's a trend now called reaction videos. Where something happens, you can either watch the content or you watch somebody else's reaction to that content. And you will find the reaction videos are getting more views and consumption than the actual content because the person who is giving a reaction is more exciting and entertaining than the actual news itself. So people are entering the content game from different directions. Sometimes somebody just creates the top 10 funny things that happened in Nigeria today. He's not a journalist, but he just knows how to use video editing technology to stitch these things together and he gets his views. And if he puts that on social media or on YouTube, he gets paid for that because you are watching it. So I think when you look at it from those three blocks, find the one that works best for you and then um, sort of double down on that and I think people will be able to sort of build careers in, in content creation from either of these three angles. Let me allow the other guys to add to it. Okay, um, yeah. th th thank you very much, Oti. Uh, Abdullah, of course I, I know like uh, Daffy suggested, you, you want to say something on, on this question. 
And as you do, I, I would like you to add a twist to it. As people create content the, and develop careers along this value chain uh, of content creation, at the end of the day, what people want to see is consumption. You want your content to get to the views, the eyeballs, or the listening ears, or to the minds of those consuming it. On the social media, the best ways it appears of doing that is getting a social media influencer to endorse, to push, to retweet, depending on what the platform is. So there is a race as people build content to want to become influencers themselves because that is when you get the following. So tell us, as people build content, is building content the end in itself or is it about getting to become an influencer regardless of the content media you are using? Thank you very much. Um, like you rightly said, you know, that's what we call media convergence. Uh, my thinking actually is, you know, uh, particularly with the uh, youngsters who are, who are passionate for content creation, you know, to make money or to influence things or to even do advocacy is they want to make it a one-man show. It is not supposed to be so. Let me say an instance. If you enter newsrooms in the last 10, 15 years, you'll hardly see social media units or even IT units. But now, almost all the media organizations, the traditional media, employ people who are non-journalists who are non-IT experts but are simply social media experts. They know that they have the skills to attract traffic because like I said, you know, uh, advertisers now look at the analytics. If you post a story, how many people have you reached with it? How many of them read it? So all these things matter. So instead of just, uh, I'm not a journalist, good, I'm IT savvy and I want to create a content, you can engage others. Let the English be good, that is one. Let it be in good taste, that is two. Don't do so much sensationalization because it will take you to fake news. Another aspect, actually, that uh, people need to be more concerned about is about you have fake news because of the absence of gatekeepers on social media. Yes, you have the phone. You can pick any picture and post it and assume that it is happening now. Let me set an instance. I think about three weeks ago or two weeks ago, there was a video of a very big mall in Abuja being attacked. I know I overheard my neighbors. There are some ladies. They have started again. They have started again. You know, as a journalist, I said, no. This is an old video. It was the video of the NSAS thing that when some hoodlums wanted to attack a big shopping mall along the airport road. But now they were educated. And the other one is even a university teacher. But the way they, so I have to talk, say, Madam, no, that video is an old one. Oh. Because she started calling her brother, is this, let him not follow that road. I want to feel. You can see the care was being created by the action of one social media uh, guy. That's why, journal, that's why we come in. We receive all these torrents of videos. So something is happening. We can't just go with it. We have to find out. If you tell me something, I have to corroborate it with at least two other sources. Who should know? If something is happening in Abuja, I'm not calling my old, my granny in the village. I say, Mama, have you seen this? No. People who should know. 
So gatekeeping is important. Let me cite another instance. You, we all know Linda Ikeji. At the time, Linda Ikeji has more followers than GT Bank. I don't know whether the analytics have changed now. 2011, 2015, she made so much money, more than so many media organizations, because she has followers. Even though she had issues with copyright and what if you. My brother here will file a story from the villa. She will just yank it up, paste it on her site. And because she has social media people, I know it will go viral. Whereas, this is the original content owner. So that issue about copyright. But what I'm saying here is this. She created something. She is not a, she's a non-media person. She doesn't create content herself. She picks people's content, sometimes without even attribution. And because of that, you know, sometimes she sensationalized the headline. The way my brother will file a story from the State House will be different from the way she will put the headline. She will put it in such a way that Nigerians, you know, I, you hurt the politician so much. Say a senator, blah, 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 blah. Say yes, now them, them. Now them, them. So whatever they say is uh, right. But fundamentally, I say there is a convergence now. If you go to a newsroom, typical newsroom, apart from the reporters who go out and source the news, some are in the National Assembly, some are in the villa, some are in the courts, and what have you. They will file in, and the editors are there to filter it. If there is even, let it not be ambiguous, call what is happening, to make it publishable. They push it. The IT people will push it online. The social media will start doing what they know best. They do the tagging. You understand? They do the mentioning. It has to do with, let's say, uh, the CJ and Mohammed Tanko that resigned yesterday. You tag NJC, Supreme Court, MBA, and what a few. And before you know it, all these segments, they have followers. And the two will go viral. You understand? Let's see the breaking news yesterday. The man resigned early, very early in the morning, on Monday, right? The newspapers did not have that news, so it wasn't on the print. So it was the social media, it was the online media that take the story. By the time they come out today, they will tell you the next day the real reason why the man resigned. He said on ill health, but they said, mba, something fishy actually happened. The man was asked to resign at gunpoint, or what a few. So in this, uh, guys, I think what yeah. we should do is, okay. there are dozens of opportunities. You don't need to read mass communication, journalism, or text. You have to do mass communication, public relation, advertisement, marketing communication, political communication, and it was, before you, in four years, you'll have gray hair. But now, you come to base University, you can just pick multimedia and do your three-year or four-year course on it. You can just pick marketing communication. And you don't need to even work for any with this. You can take videos. Video is so good and real, you get paid for it. Same thing with uh, so many media organizations. You take an accident, pic a, a picture of a lawmaker who is, you are spending so much millions on him and you went there or sleeping. It's a front page picture. <laughs> so, uh, I, know, I know if I continue to allow you, you, you will talk and talk and talk on this topic. But I, I, I'd like to move the conversation back to Stephen. Mm -hmm. uh, challenges and interesting perspective are, have been raised. Now, books and reading and content are, are synonymous. And a lot of the technologies and opportunities that are being raised are also things that people who are authors themselves can take advantage of. Are there new technologies or how are authors, those who are creating content around books, embracing new technologies of 
voice to text, uh, machine learning, uh, translation, and so on to enhance the quality and the speed and scale of the books and contents they are creating. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the, the advent of technology changed the entire, the value chain of books, the arrangement of the value chain of book publishing. Back in the day, you would need to write your book, your manuscript via hand in the 80s, early 90s. You give it to a typesetter, the typeset everything. You take it to an editor, the editor does their work, take it back to the type, typist. She puts together whatever, then they bring out the final draft. And then when the final draft is out, you now go start looking for a traditional publisher, right? And God help you, you get as few as 10 rejections. <laughs> if you are lucky enough, they come, you find a publisher that can get onto the book early, fine, good for you. And then there's a waiting list. You can stay up to a year or two, on your book is in the burner while your publisher, you know, still does extra work on it until it's out. By the end of the day, from ideation to the point where it gets into the hands of your readers could take several months, if not years. But today, all that has been reduced to a matter of hours. In fact, there's an e-book where I, there's an e-book I read that the author said he, this book was written under two hours. That's written, published, and sent out to his email list and everybody got a copy of the book not hard copy now the e-copy of the book under two hours technology has done a lot of disruption to the book industry and i'm not just saying it's not either for good or for bad it depends on how you can leverage on that to push out your content today as an author i've published two books electronically and I didn't have to go through all this process I just mentioned. I ideated the book, typed it in my laptop, passed it to an editor for extra eyes, you know, for scrutiny and all. At the end of the day, I passed it through a graphic designer, did the whole thing, and it was out on Amazon, and then it was out to my mailing list and other people who were interested in getting a copy of it. I didn't have to go through the traditional route, waiting for months and even years to get my book out, even if that had, has its advantages and disadvantages too. So what I would advise authors today is look for what is the end goal of your book. The content you are putting out in form of a book, what is the end goal? Do you want a name? Do you want to be published by Rutledge? You want to be published by Macmillan? then you will have to understand the trade-off required in traditional publishing and pay that price. And sometimes that price is time. And also your content being tinkered with because the editors that will be looking at your book will also play with some of your ideas and you have to be willing to put up with that, right? But if you are the type of Mark Twain who doesn't want his work being tinkered with, you can go the way of self-publishing. And there's also a price for that, okay? The good part of that is speed, and then you have control over whatever comes out of that book. The other side is the initial cost you have to put into it. And may I also add that traditional publishing avenues also give you the, the, you know, the reach. It gives you the reach, the popularity that the publishing house can afford you. So, for instance, today, if you want to publish your book, you can write it on your laptop, change it into a PDF, go on Amazon, open um, an author account, go through the steps, upload your book there, go on Facebook, go on YouTube, if you already have a following there, or Twitter, or on other social media platforms, and put the link and tell your followers that, hey, I have a book, you would like it, this is what I've been working on. If this book will help you, this is the deliverables, it will give you A, B, and C. And with the click of a button, they will get your book on Amazon, and if you're able to set up the payment system well, you'll be getting paid. And it's not just Amazon. There are BAM books, uh, several other Nigerian local platforms where you can put your book, seller.co. 
You can put your books out there and get paid in Naira or in any other foreign currency. That's the miracle of the digital age today with authors. Now, I also, let me just add this part too. Um, while putting out your content, right, putting out free content and sharing your content, it's important that you build, you build a following because the most important commodity in the digital age is attention. If you cannot get people's attention, whatever, it, whatever you are doing, it's, a, it's labor in futility. I must say that. So one of the ways you can trap people's attention is to give, what pe give people what I call a, um, a, a lead magnet. That's what is being called in the digital sense, a lead magnet where you're able to package your value. Instead of putting out random posts here and there, you've been able to package your knowledge in a way that profits people. In a, uh, I call it a minimum viable product or minimum viable uh, product that you can serve to your audience. For instance, for me, it's a reading guide. For instance, for me, it's a writing guide. Just a 10-page document. You want to learn about this? Oh, come get it. Subscribe to my mailing list. Once you can get into that, I've gotten you hooked. You will keep hearing from me from time to time. Already I've given you the first value you can get from me, which is the guide. Okay, so put this in perspective. When you are putting out content, get a minimum viable product and be able to get attention and communicate with your followers consistently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, we need to move a bit faster with the answers. So, uh, Smith, I want to ask you uh, yes or no, or maybe one or two sentences afterwards, if you may. Uh, censorship is a big concern with content and publishing. Traditional publishing is already subjected to a lot of regulation and censorship uh, because they are known media. Online, because of territorial laws, they're on the internet, jurisdiction is an issue, uh, censorship is a bit difficult. We all know and remember very clearly the Twitter ban in Nigeria, right? Do you subscribe to censorship of media? Should it be more? Should it be less? Um, What's your take on, on censorship and, and media? That, that, that would be, because this is something that affects all of us. What's your view of how social media or traditional media, should they be censored, should they not? Should we just allow people to say what they want and so on? Thank you. So the, the first we need to consider is about uh, the, what kind of, political practice to we to we know we are a democratic country where everybody can say his mind you know you are free to express yourself the way you like you know so putting embargo on how I express myself I think many many Nigerians refer to it so that means you are restricting us you are telling us that this is what we need to say and we don't need to say this so I believe that we should be given that freedom to express ourselves the way we want to express ourselves, just like the way it happens all over the um, democratic countries. I'll follow up on that, uh, Daffy. Now, I want to link it a bit to your kind of business. Um, we all also are aware of how in every country, uh, globally, even the most developed countries, there is an attempt to slow down the dominance and influence of digital platforms now, not, not, the, not the content provider, the platforms. Uh, their influence are huge. They themselves uh, claim they are self-regulating. They suspend people's accounts. They sometimes uh, completely disable people's account. Now, for someone who plays in the business of providing content infrastructure, because that sounds like that's what you do, do you 
anticipate or have concerns around the possibility of government or regulatory entities coming after your customers or clamping down on some of the services they provide within your space and, and therefore the possible option of impacting your business. So, and if you do, how do you think this kind of issue should be managed should they happen? I think it still goes back to the roots is censorship. And uh, then we ask the other question, what do you intend to achieve with censorship? And uh, why do we really need censorship? Uh, to a large extent, I think there are already laws. So which means whatever content is presented out there uh, should not be offensive to some other people around you. As much as you have freedom to express yourself, you also have to consider the, other, the next party uh, beside you. Having said that, so what really gave rise to what, what I will call the third media, the social media today in journalism? It's the root lies in the government authorities trying to manage content that is delivered to the government. So you want to tell a story the way you want the story to be told. So for instance, my brother here uh, uh, confirmed you know, the resignation of the, of the Chief Justice of Nigeria. And why? So people, that's, it's not enough to say he has resigned. You have to put an explanation to it. And you have to justify the explanation because you're not dealing with dummies. People need to process it and, and understand that this is acceptable and so on. So the third media gained its roots by trying to expose the reality behind the reason. And so people started seeing that and getting attracted to it. And so other stuff started building around it, marketing, fake news, and everything started coming around it today. However, back to the question you asked. How does it impact my own people, my constituents? So we offer services that helps you to localize this content. So Steve talked of mailing lists, you know, followership and so on. So when you get into the mailing list, what do you see? Phone numbers, house address, email address, date of birth, other details. And you would think that is ordinary, right? So I look at it, you are female. The marketers will start doing what? Advertising female words to you. So they come to Steve and say, Steve, let me get the demography of the female within your list and say, okay, 20% below 20. Yeah, so I, I give you content, you advertise to those people, right? Or your web page, I start putting, and so they, they structure they look at that Steve mailing list and create content around it and push to, to Steve. As much as that is good from a marketing perspective, there's the evil side of it. So I start sipping in stories that will pass my own intent. So I tell you, okay, this government is corrupt. But the perspective is I'm trying to change the government, not because uh, for the general good of the people, but for myself. So I start pushing in content to Steve that will appeal to Steve followers. And then you then begin to see where, and I think that's where the issues with social media regulations start coming in. And sometimes everything is open to abuse, right? From the, from the regulator's perspective, from the people who are processing, and so on and so forth. However, I think we have a conscience, largely. And uh, we have to do what is right. And there are existing laws already. So when you go against this, these laws, when you start sending uh, your followers list, exporting it for people who can manipulate content for them negatively, then uh, I, I think the law has to prevail. And that's what we are seeing with the likes of Facebook today. And some other countries are saying that, okay, 
Even if Facebook is saying that they will self-regulate, there is a part of it. So when Facebook violates existing laws in Nigeria, can they be held accountable? No. No registered entity in Nigeria. So it brings us back again to content domestication. So how do we ensure that these medias do not manipulate our people? And if you do, you, we openly, I mean, I'm not looking at uh, you taking a stick to hit anybody because they are telling the truth when you are hearing. But genuinely, how do we hold these people accountable? And that's what Unitelas is standing for. So we provide a platform for you. You can launch your content. So we understand these contents are driven by application. Applications are running in some data centers or somewhere else. So we are bringing this infrastructure. You can run your applications. You can run your websites, for instance, internally. As long as you have nothing to hide. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much, Daffy. Uh, I would like um, three people. Uh, after this question, uh, audience, we're, we're on the final stretch. We're approaching the home stretch now. So if you do have any question, please begin to... Wow, I, I, I told you this is the session for the people. So we would take those questions. Please get ready with your questions. So I, I will make this, therefore, my final question. So uh, after the question from the audience, what you will be doing will be your closing uh, remarks, each of you. So f for this question, I would like um, Oti, uh, Abdallah, and um, Steven to just quickly give me your thought. Now, perhaps it's, it's something I'm sure is on the mind of the audience. I'm a young person. I create content. I want to be famous. I want my content to be out there. I want followers. We have seen people get desperate and do interesting things. Young people, young females, young males, kids. That there are stories of children in uh, schools and what they do and how social media has influenced them. Uh, Abdullah told us that, uh, no, it, it was uh, Oti, I beg your pardon, that as humans, we ultimately in any settings, we want to be heard, we want to build relationships. In our group, we want to have a voice. Now, in a positive way, and this is a good desire to have, everybody on the internet desire following. I want my Twitter follower to become 200,000, half a million. What should I do? How do I go about? Am I speaking your mind? What steps can I take? What should I do? Thank you. I don't know who wants to go first. No, I I, I'll go so that uh, other people can make it sweeter. <laughs> there, is, there is no silver bullet, really. Um, if you check out a lot of the people who are big today on social media, um, they started a long time ago. Consistency is what brought a lot of them to where they are. Uh, in some cases, it was one random video from two years ago or three years ago that suddenly just got picked up by a, either the right person or at the right time, and then it made sense. So, and it's almost the same story for every comedian or content creator that you see out there. Um, I would give some sort of formula um, that I have seen over time and it is it's not random it's data driven anybody today that wants to succeed with content needs three key ingredients um, originality and that means whatever it is you are putting out there that is content needs to be as natural to you as possible so that you don't find yourself being this person today, that person tomorrow, and there's no 
even if you've been doing it for two years, three years, there is no consistency or pattern around it. But if you're original to yourself, to say whether I have two followers or two million followers, this is what I would have still been saying or doing, then it becomes like natural clockwork for you, right? Um, that part is key. The other two, they are very strategic and um, numbers driven. Do your research to find out what type of content people are jumping on at a particular point in time, right? There is a reason, there is a reason why things trend. The problem is that as consumers of the content, we don't pay attention to the science behind things that trend. We just consume it, we laugh, and we move on. But if you are attentive, you will notice that certain things trend at certain time of the year in certain locations or as a result of certain things that are happening, right? So that's why you will find out that something can happen last year and it suddenly resurfaces again this year because the trigger from last year that nobody was paying attention to has reoccurred again. And I'll give you um, a typical example. A lot of us know Mommy Gio on social media today, right? She's been popular um, in the early part of this year. Yeah? And that was as a result of people, it, it sort of happened around the time where you would have this occasional wave of people really questioning what pastors are doing and everything. It comes and then it goes silent. So anybody that sticks out around that period will suddenly become the sensation. If you check the time, at the beginning of last year, we were all going crazy about Indaboski. It was around the same time, right? Why? Because these people came up with that early part of the year when you are still dealing with your resolutions and everything and you are trying to maintain sanity for the year, that's when everybody pays attention to these type of things. So this type of content works with time and the mindset of people at that point in time. So anybody that just does something outrageous, you stick out and then people carry it about. That's the second part, around paying attention to the factors that influence a particular trend. And then the third one will be the fact that you have to hack it in the sense that you need to seek for that attention if you want to grow following, right? So what it means is today, I can create a piece of content. I'm not a funny guy, I didn't do anything. But it only takes maybe a Don Jazzy or a, um, one of those heavy social media handles like uh, Funny Africa or only in Nigeria and all those things, or Yaba Left or uh, what they call this guy again, Tunde Ednot. He just needs to retweet it, right? When Tunde Ednot retweets content, it's not because um, he was just playing around the internet and he found it. People keep tagging him in their content every time that one day maybe this guy might find my own worthy enough to put on his channel and it will go out. Some people have been tagging him for years. He has never paid attention to their content. But it's there. He's just scrolling through. Why? Because he's at a higher level in the social media game. So he needs to keep consistency with his own page by putting content that he thinks people will like. Right? But if you don't keep trying to get his attention, Don Jazzy's attention and all that, they are not necessarily going to find yours. The way the algorithm works is if you have very few followers, it's not necessarily going to randomly show up, right? So you need to beg for that attention. So if you put those three together by saying, one, this is me. I'm going to keep putting the content out there, whether anybody is seeing it or not. I'm just telling my story and I'm doing what I like for fun. People, there are people today, they are three years old on social media. They post every week, but they are still less than 500 followers. It's not their fault. It just hasn't picked up yet. If you continue doing that, then secondly, let your content be data-driven to a large extent. I'm paying attention to the type of content people are creating. There is a trend. There's this recent trend, people jumping around like um, 
their leg is not touching the ground they're just floating type of thing you put your own out there maybe that's the one that will catch there's a um, trend of people doing different things on uh, instagram reel and TikTok. how are you going to make sure that when there was a trend you put your own out there you, thirdly you keep targeting the right people your own might just be the one that they will pick up and amplify and that's literally how you continue today there are probably over a hundred thousand content creators looking for their big break some people may only have started two weeks ago and they hit gold because they put out the right content at the right time and it got amplified by the right person so i'll break it just leave it at those three key rules today be original um follow the trend be analytical about it and then tag people so that they can find you and amplify your content that's my own contribution I think uh, mine would be uh, more far away from what uh, my colleague said, but uh, fundamentally, like you said, the product. The chief law officer of the country has resigned around 3.30 a.m. on Monday. Not p.m., a.m. Not at the Supreme Court headquarters or oh, his house in the villa, at the yellow house. That is one. Why? You all know this. If you have this now, that news is a product. But how do you deliver it? The delivery is very important. Is he the first chief law officer to be accused of corruption? No. So maybe as a student, what I would simply do is, I will do some research. I can do it in two hours. On again, before him, was accused of corruption. He was even prosecuted. Before then, we had Justice Weiss. He was equally a CGN, a young lawyer stood in front of the Supreme Court in the Supreme Court chambers before the Chief Justice of Nigeria and pointedly accused him of corruption. If you Google it, you know, Honda versus uh, Hyundai case. He accused the Chief Justice of collecting bribe from Hyundai. Immediately after that, you can understand what that means. A baby lawyer, as they call it. Immediately after that, the whole thing went gaga and the man had to leave. Just take the three pictures of these people. Do the timeline. This one went so, so time. Reason. Oh, the three CJNs accused of corruption. You can put it out there. It's new. And you are giving out quality information. That is one. And secondly, Okay, this is a private university. Most of the, your colleagues elsewhere are on, at home for more than six months because of 200 billion. But the same government has budgeted four trillion naira on subsidy. Subsidy to be administered by NNPC. NNPC that is accountable only to the presidency. Four trillion universities are closed because of 200 billion. Okay, how do you put it? You have to learn certain basic uh, skills. One of it is infographics. And they can tell you there are so many um, uh, apps up there. You do, can do Excel, spreadsheet, you can do bar chart, pie chart, and what if you? There are so many domains up there that you can insert this information. It can give you a beautiful infogram. Tag it and want to be put it up there. You will get followers because you know you have gathered information, sensitized it, and delivered it. Many parents are at home, children are at home. Okay, this is what the government is spending. And not only that, the four trillion can pay up ASU. 
the four trillion can pay the 600 and uh, 780 billion naira the federal government needs to fix Abuja, Kaduna, Zaria, Kano Road. This four trillion they are spending on this BOGO subsidy. You remember the president said he didn't believe in subsidy. Can fix, maybe you have forgotten about it, the East West Coast Road. It has been there since the Obasanjo time. How much do we need to fix it? 680 billion. That road cut across more than five states. It linked the southeast with the south south. The CBN, the NNPC, for instance, is spending about 600 billion to construct 61 roads, 21 roads across the country. The same four trillion can do that 21 roads at 600 billion. It can do Abuja, Kano, Zaria Road at 780. It can do the East West Coast Road at about 700 and 650. It can pay ASU. All this information can be done in a single infographics. What 400 trillion subsidy, 4, 4 trillion subsidy can do? You can put ASU, you can put the Kano uh, Abuja Road, you can put the 21, uh, you can put the so, you know, with this, you can get traction. What I will add is, maybe finally is, don't be in haste. That's the major problem with most of us. I want to be like Linda Ikeji today. Master Steve, Steve has one million Twitter followers. And I want to have one million Twitter followers. No, it doesn't happen that way. You don't know the effort he has been putting at the back end. So much effort is being put out there. Abdullah, I always have to stop you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to do that now, too. <laughs> Stevie, please. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, social media for me came in a bit um, late, just five years ago. I joined social media because I was supposed to have joined a course. And the only way I could get access to the course was to get at what to join Facebook at the time. And when I joined, I intended to, you know, deactivate the account as soon as I was done. But then I'd been writing. So I found out that I could share my write ups on Facebook. And I started doing that in 2017. And people started to like my content. They loved what I shared and then it started to attract eyeballs then after a while i started sharing more on treating my message towards developing a reading culture and then i created a product out of that and people loved the product they bought into it and then i people who bought into that idea i created a community for them and that was how my reader circle book club was born so if it's on social media, one of the things I would say is that, first of all, find a message. There is a message you have. And you're not going to find it immediately. It took, me, it took me several months of putting out my thoughts on social media. And prior, before that, may I just say that, that before that, I'd been journaling for at least 10, 8 years before that time. So it was easy for me to put out my thoughts on social media because I've been writing for myself. So get a message, and it may take you a while to find that particular message, but just find it. Put it out there consistently. Your crowd will come. When that crowd comes, create a community for them. And it's important because Community building is where content survives, where content thrives, and that's where content stays. So create a community for them around that ideology that you have put yourself forward and make sure that your message, you are, a, you are an embodiment of that message. For instance, reading. Most of the time, whenever I put out my reading goals online, I tell people, hey, this is the book I'm reading right now. I post book reviews and then people come up to tell me, okay, uh, I like this book, where can I get it? And then I refer them to bookstores in their, in their local areas. And that was how people got to know me as a read somebody who loves reading and 
you know, tell people the importance of reading and even share systems for effective reading for busy people. So create a community around that and let your community members spread your message. And that's how your movement grows. Now, when I did that with Facebook, I moved to LinkedIn and shared the same, the same format I just showed you now. People didn't know me so much on LinkedIn at the time, so I kept putting out content consistently. My message, this is how I did it. Like the former earlier speaker has said, there are many other ways to do it. You can jump on trends, you can jump on things that are happening, people that are catch, things that are catching people's eyeballs at the moment. But for me, this is what I did. I found a message, and then I found a content strategy. And my content strategy had to do with, you know, finding a relevant message, finding a ready market and audience, and finding a viable medium. I had to study the mediums I was on. Facebook is different from LinkedIn. LinkedIn is different from Instagram. Instagram is different from Twitter, and the algorithm works differently. So you may have to study these things for yourself, right? And also, what I would say add is credibility. There should be some form of credibility. Credibility goes beyond a cool headshot and a blue tick. You know, you have to ask yourself, what do I want people to think of me and my business? Or what I stand for? I'll suggest the last method. You look the part, act the part, sound the part, and think the part. So back to my reading habit again. Each time I'm reading a book, I, I take a screenshot of, or I take a picture of myself reading, or I get somebody to picture me reading, and then I put it on my social media handle. This is what I'm doing. What book are you reading? You know, that kind of conversation starter. So it began to give people the idea that this is what I do, this is who I am, and I stayed with it. Then consistency is also very important. You cannot you know, post twice today and then disappear for the next two weeks or three weeks. It doesn't work like that. You're building a community here. You're building a following, right? Out of sight is out of mind online. It, do, it works everywhere, but online it's so true. When you disappear from your audience for too long, they replace you with someone else. That's the truth. So you have to stay consistent with it. And when the more people start to know you, they begin to share your content organically. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So please, um, we have really run out of time. I would start from the last rule. The question, your name, and straight to your question, please. I, I will take it, the section of the audience, one section at a time. I would like to take this section first. So please just go to the speaker. No, not you yet. Just, just, just go to the microphone ask your, your name and your question and, and then we'll answer the question in 30 seconds straight to your question name and question thank you okay my my name is charles onyuku okay my first question my first question will go to you mr abdullah um won't having gatekeepers as as um, on social media won't it amount to silencing on popular opinions or maybe as a government just choose who says what for example we are in a government now that is let me not even talk about that just my question is won't it silence unpopular or unwanted opinions now secondly my i would like to commend um, the people from unitellers i'd like to commend you for building infrastructure in africa it's quite commendable but I want to ask a, two questions. If you go to developer communities, there's a very strong bias, especially with hosting custom applications with Nigerian service providers, in the sense that they get access to your code and then they use it even without your consent. I'm talking about custom application, you've built it over time, maybe with a team and stuff like that. But because it's now hosted on your servers, you can be able to have access to it and then it goes out. Now, that is just one. What are you doing to address that? It's a bias already. It's out there. If you want to build, you want to go to where? Can, can we stop at two questions? I think that's good enough. Uh, because it looks like you want to ask a third one. 
please, please, it's very important. <laughs> because yesterday you talked of um, the, the race of technologies getting there first. And they've gotten here first by building infrastructure in Nigeria. But every developer wants to have distributed servers, distributed, um, um, if, like, you want your information to be distributed across servers. If you host on Amazon, someone in the US and Europe gets to it quickly. So what, what are you doing? Are you looking at partnering with them out there so that even when people host with you here, can they be able to distribute their content so that it's not just fast in Nigeria, but fast anywhere in the world? Thank you. OK, it, it's a good question. Thank you very much. Please, uh, let's make the answers short and, and straight to the point. Abdullah, the first question is for you. So I'll be watching you closely, Abdullah, for time. <laughs> My brother, get keepers. Get keepers are there to sharpen the thought. Two things. They edit for veracity. They have to ensure that the story is true. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the language. It's English, so for instance, you can, the grammar should be good. And finally, they even test the angle that something happened now, which is the best angle to deliver, I want to view. They are not actually there to kill uh, stories, no. They sharpen it. What is the raw thing, you know, they process it, I want to view. And what you have there is a final, and even the length. It's one hour video, but we'll end up giving you one minute video it from that one hour and send the message you understand thank you excellent job thank you thank you uh, 30 seconds for each much. there are two questions 30 seconds each okay so the question is about the infrastructure that we have built here how credible it is if you look at 20, 2020 we know Veeam Veeam is one of the uh, biggest uh, backup agents in the world today, US-based company. So they took our product around the world throughout 2020 because we are the first to be able to offer what they call immutable, immutable storage backup. And um, because of our credibility in terms of the security that we provide, that is why you see that um, um, organizations like NASA, you know, is banking on, on, on our infrastructure. So we maintain that level of um, you know, credibility in terms of security. And also, when you talk about, you talk about um, uh, multi-cloud distributed, distributed content. So we are the biggest edge cloud provider in the world. Yes, AWS is not yet there. We're not talking that we are bigger than AWS, but we have footprint bigger than AWS, which is over 400 cloud and five in Nigeria. So if you are in Nigeria, we also have what they call federated edge cloud. It's only our product that offer that federated, which means you can be in Nigeria today and you can be in all over the world at the same time. So be in Nigeria, be in US, be in Japan, be in all over country at a time. So you are not just, we're not just deploying in Nigeria for you to tell us where and where and where and where do you want your servers to be located and you will get it in less than 10 minutes, located all over the world. So I want Dapit to also talk okay, more. Okay, can I just uh, quickly on okay. the idea of security of your content, your codes. So in the cloud, so you have a VPC created for you as a customer. In that VPC, we don't have a tenant admin right. So which means I cannot go into your servers. I cannot see what you are running. Even though the infrastructure, we are housing the infrastructure. We don't have access to your applications. We don't know your username. We don't know your credentials. That's how it is. So you have that control. We'll give you that control. Then you talked of content delivery. Very many ways we can set up that content delivery. So which is basically saying that you create a front for users maybe around the US. They hit your web page. And the content, that same content is being assessed in Nigeria. And that speed should be guaranteed across all the platforms, right? So there are multiple ways we can assist you to get that going. It's just for us, it's just how far do you want to go? Okay. What do you intend to achieve? Thank, Thank you, you. Dafe. So uh, we'll take questions from the middle of the aisle. 
please we will be giving priorities to ladies to compensate for the gender insensitivity of the panel ladies please we would like to take a question or two from you thank you gentlemen please go ahead thank you my name is Johanna Joseph Walia uh, my first my, I will just summarize my question so if it concerns anybody you can just reply to me because uh, as, a, as a for me actually uh, you tell us what are calling you tell us um, I have a database of electronic African electronic literature that I built uh, two years ago and and then because it's very expensive to host such kind of work in Nigeria I have to host it in Poland so how effective is your how cheap is your hosting I, I will come I will come to, uh, you will answer me back um, Steven yeah from your, from your uh, explanation, reading has changed into audio reading, watching, clicking. Do you people also involved in a video game reading? Because it's also a form of reading and it contains African, um, it contains also literary aspect. And that is why I have to like archive those things in my database, africanelite.org, for the people to read. Which kind of content is it only, do you also consider I am distant writer. Distant writer simply means I use algorithm and uh, artificial intelligence to write work, automatic to to is to program and it's produce works for people to read. Do you also also interested in also? Uh, are you also considering those kind of content also? Uh, uh, Sir Abdullah, what's the fate of traditional media? When everything now we can get the news from the social media and how do you people get money to feed, uh, to like pay your staff because everybody now is on social media what used to be honor and uh, 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 what used to be in your custody, custody is already in the hands of uh, the public so how do you how, how was the fate and how like somebody that want to become journalist now go to school how is he going to do that thank you very much and that is Thank you. I was going to say, I hope you don't have number four. But I, I will jump right in on the first question. Um, I would just say that I'm sure the product is competitive. They have a stand because um, there, there's a stand for the company at the exhibition stand. Uh, I'm sure you can get detailed pricing information on their product and services. Please visit the stand. Uh, I, I'm sure they can give you a figure right here, sitting here. But uh, at least it's a Nigerian service, so you know that uh, for one, uh, the people service you are Nigerians, and that will impact on the cost as well, make it more affordable. So I would have the panel answer the other two questions, please. Thank you. If I okay. got your questions correctly, if I got your question correctly, you were asking that um, that you host, you have a platform where that is AI powered, and they are, you know, you have this reading. The, the question, the question is, in terms of content creation and reading specifically, yes. games, video games, and video broadly are they considered part of reading and uh, your network are you also sharing content around that or is it just only about books okay. traditional books okay, and audio okay, books okay, okay gaming well i think the gaming industry is quite vast if that's if we're, if we're going to be talking about that that's that's a whole in the industry on its own now what i do encourage members of my community uh in terms of is I, I recommend mental exercises for them. I recommend toys such as ruby cubes and other, you know, other, as other uh, objects or other systems that enable them to build their minds. But gaming in itself is a different ballgame. That's what I'm just going to say. Um, what we do with, with Adrida Seku, we recommend books, audio books traditional uh, print books in print and of course ebooks 
and I also recommend videos for them. But I, I also encourage them to tinker with other things that stimulate their creativity because I, we believe in Reader Circle, we believe that where books matter, nothing else would suffice. Everything or every, you know, every system of building our mental capacity has its own advantage in its own unique way. So books thank have its own use over th there. Thank you, yes. Steven. I think that should suffice. Abdallah, please. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's a very, the, the traditional media, you know, they are in a very uh, stressful uh, situation. Dwindling adverse revenue, poor leadership, like, you know, uh, and even the circulation has uh, drastically, I remember um, in the last five, seven years, points, trust, the nation, the sun, publish about 100,000 copies daily. They are not publishing one third of that figure now. That's why when you pick the paper, you see where are the rest. In trust, for instance, uh, there was a standing order that it shouldn't be left than 64 page, whether there is advert or no. But now they are publishing 32, 28. But Therefore, they are equally migrating. You know, they are migrating with the audience. How? They have changed the nature of the stories for you to survive. We saw an instance by yesterday, by Monday morning, we all know that the CJN has resigned. So you are coming out 12 hours, 15 hours later with a print newspaper. What are you going to report? CJN has resigned? No. That is why you have to investigate what actually happened. It was then we realized that he was even, he resigned at almost gunpoint around 3.30 in the morning at the Yellow House. Why? Because of some corruption allegations that has to do with his family members. Secondly, data journalism. I gave the example of the budget, the four trillion the Buhari government budgeted for subsidy, while ASU is crying for only 200 billion. The CJN is going to earn, he will be given 2.6 billion as severance. Yes. And they will build a house for him in Asokoro or Maitama, like they did to his predecessors. All these are news that are not on social media. Professional journalists, journalists need to investigate. You have to go through the data, storify them. And again, uh, Abdallah. Other, maybe finally, sir, the, the, the other okay. aspect is um, fact-checking. Is the new trend, and there is money for it. When Lai Muhammad says something, we just look around. No, check the data. Is he lying or not? You fact-check him. And you go with the owner. So there is actually a migration now from owner. And they got that by, when you do all this, they are like MacArthur Foundation. They form all right, all thank you of, now. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Abdullah. Please, from the final question, please. Uh, you can, any lady that wants to ask a question? Um, good afternoon, everyone. So my question is about the trend and the, the dangers of fake news, as uh, all of us m might have you know, noticed. So hailing services like Uber, Bolt, and the rest, a lot of cars are on the road, you understand? And everybody could have you know, stopped anyone for like, uh, I can offer my services as a taxi driver. But Uber, Bolt, and the rest, Taxify, utilized that opportunity, vetted people, individuals with their own private vehicles, to become taxi drivers. So anything that happens to some extent, the security within the public transport system is there for these companies. So you can easily know what that, who that driver is and if something happens. Can we have major social media platforms, Meta, Twitter, and the rest, inculcating such with regards to journalism? Blue ticks, blue ticks don't, don't, don't perform anything anymore. After all, they are not about journalists only. We've seen Twitter inculcating, you know, um, NFTs as social, uh, as uh, profile pics to certify the owner of that NFT via his profile picture. 
But can't we have such with journal, uh, uh, journalism, you know, having journalists on social medias rather than anyone publishing any news? We can now have uh, those journalists that are vetted or recommended by major journalists or certified with whatsoever means so that they can still publish and it will be an open source something. There will be a lot of them out there, but anything that comes from that handle can be verified. And if it happens to be a fake news, can easily be tracked down and, you know, uh, penalized for broadcasting fake news. So is, is it possible for such to happen? And is the media sector, my question is directed to you, uh, Mr. Abdullah, is the media sector, you know, and the journalist, uh, this thing, union or something, pushing for such? Because either they do it or it is left for we, the laymen, with that regards, to keep on publishing news that can't be verified. Thank you. Yeah, there are efforts actually in doing that, you know. Um, as professional journalists, you know, we have responsibility. We have a uh, right to expression or whatever you, but we have to do it responsibly. That's the difference between professional journalists, maybe and social order. Or we have like the Nigerian Union of Journalists. You know, we have Guild of Editors. The online medias have their own association. So there are efforts to do that, but it's difficult. Do you know why? Because People have with uh, 10,000 era Android phone, with uh, 15 era data, one can post anything and it can go uh, viral. And another difficulty there is, you know, any somebody acts that uh, even get keeping amounts to shutting down information you don't want. So that's the problem, and that's why even the government is finding it very uh, difficult. But it's very easy for you to find out. You will know uh, 21st Century uh, Chronicle, we have a website, we have a certified, all our social media handles are certified. Same thing, Daily Trust, Premium Times, and whatever. So the effort is uh, equally there. But shutting down everybody, you know, will be very uh, difficult and activists will start saying one thing or other. So it's a continuous uh, process. Thing. Thank you. I think I just want to add to it quickly that. Um Around this time, uh, towards the end of last year, coming into early this year, WhatsApp spent a lot of money trying to sensitize people about fake news and how to individually fact check fake news before spreading. But the issue of people just randomly reporting news is very prominent as a result of the lack of consequences for doing so. So, but it starts from proper identification of citizens. So that's why this whole issue of NIN has a very long spiraling effect because you can't catch a human being that does not exist, basically. So today, if you forget your Facebook password, for you to get back in again, more often than not, they would ask you to verify yourself. Sometimes you get deliberately locked out because they want to be able to verify the citizen that is behind that account to curb the number of fake accounts, right? Now, when it goes from that level, the platforms are increasingly creating tools for people to report fake news or report handles that they consider to be peddling fake news. It's not going to be an overnight resolve but they're implementing lots and lots of technology. So the other part that NIDA is pushing now with the social or internet platform is to say, can you be present so that you can work with us locally when we start to investigate people who are peddling this type of news and we're not running a mock, whereas your platform is hindering our efforts. So those are the efforts. It's continuous, but those are efforts that are coming. Okay, so OT, just give us your final thoughts since you still have the mic in 30 seconds, please. Um, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Panelist, sure. we start with OT and then we go down. 30 seconds, final thought in 30 seconds. Thank you very much, Wasum. I think um, I want to thank everyone for uh, listening out here today. My final thought would be around the fact that, one, content is a very lucrative industry, content creation and distribution. Um, there are several areas that we can all key into. Either you are producing it, you are helping to distribute it, or you are helping people discover it. Um, it's a very lucrative industry, but it appears everything today 
now boils down to understanding some level of technology around content. So I would encourage us not to be shy when it comes to understanding how social media works, how graphic design works, how video editing works, and these little things so that you can reduce the cost when you need to get into the game of content and you're not paying people left, right, center. So that's my final thoughts for everyone interested in content today. Thank you, Oti. Abdallah. Yes, like uh, he said, communication is key. And there won't be any time that they are, will, not, will stop communicating. Therefore, uh, use leverage on the tools available to us to communicate is key. We can get money from it. Like I said, most media houses now, you know, outsource most of their jobs. There are independent infographs who are doing infographics, video editing. Like this thing like I have mentioned of the man, you can do it. When you approach me, we can pay. So my final word, like he said, is improve your skills, persevere, and you can reach your destination of dream. Thank you. Thank you, Abdallah. Steven. Okay, just one thing. Whatever it is you're doing, ensure that you increase or you increase your ability. You habitualize your ability to read books. Your ability to find the right books, just in time knowledge, read them and get the best out of every book you read. Because whether we like it or not, learning is a gateway skill that opens doors to other skills. And we're living in a, in a digital era where your ability to skill fast gives you a competitive edge over other people and over other systems around you. No matter what system you're leading, whether it's an organization, in the media space, or out of the media space. So prime your ability to find the right books to read, your ability to read those books, and put yourself in communities where it is easy to get just-in-time knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen Smith. OK, so in, a, in as much that we are helping governments around the world, to promote um, data protection around the world. We have also been able to fight against um, or promote data domestication and data sovereignty. And then we are also helping organizations around Nigeria too to come back home. So if you are in a public cloud, we are telling you, please come back home. We have the infrastructure locally here and then we serve you better we have what it takes to compete with the public cloud providers here in Nigeria. And we are telling you that you are going to get the best service so far and the best pricing so far. So please come back home if you are using public cloud because our data is not safe if you are there. You can be here generating data that is stored outside, outside Nigeria or across the border. Thank you, Smith. Dafe. Okay, just to back it up, uh, bring the content in. We have the platform, so whatever application you want to run, we have the platform to host it for you. So we encourage you to actually come back. And uh, there's also the extra benefits. You are paying in Naira, and you are also getting people employed here, so which means it's a ripple effect. And uh, you also have additionally... Uh, your, you have data sovereignty, so a whole lot you stand to benefit by, by coming back here. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Dafe. Dafe Orege is the... Orogi. O-R-O-G-H-I. Oh, okay. Orogi. 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 Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, my apologies for that. No so, problem. Dafe Orogi is the Chief Technical Officer of Unitelas International Limited. Smith Osemeke is the Managing Director and CEO of Unitelas Nigeria Limited. Uh, Steven Angulu is founder Readers Circle Club of Africa. And uh, Nuruddin Abdallah is founder and editor 21st Century Chronicles. 
finally but not the least ot correct is senior vice president product tarragon group gentlemen my pleasure to have spent time with you my name is Boson Ayeni. I'm MDC of Complimetrics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join Digital Africa final day tomorrow. Tomorrow is the final day. Please be here to be part of the sessions. Thank you and God bless.